we're here at the JCA Alumni Banquet. Nobody seems to know what year it is. We think it's the 40th or the 800th. We don't, we're not sure. I'm here with Dominic Aguizio, an alum and from the Joliet Park District. Dominic, tell us what year you graduated. I uh, graduated from Joliet Catholic in 1984, a few years ago. A few years younger than me. Just um, a few. So, uh, how does it? I know you're involved in the community, so you're back quite a bit. But does it? Do you always get a, a special feeling when you come back to? It's, 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 it's always great. nice to come home. It's especially nice this year to be here. My daughter is a 2012 graduate of JCA, so she's here with me tonight. Uh, I have a daughter that's a freshman here this year, so it's always like coming back home and uh, to see to see what's new at the school, but also to continue to be a part of it as a parent now. And I know in the summer months you you employ. Hundred, almost thousands of, of part-time employees at the Park District, and, and a lot of them come from JCA. And how, how does that work for you? Well, we you know we always look for kids that uh, have good backgrounds and um, have potential to be leaders in the community. So you know those kids that come from Joliet Catholic always seem to possess those kind of skills, and uh, we're, we're glad to, to be able to help them out in that way. But also. You know, it's really special to be home to most of Joliet Catholic's football games and all their other events too. So, you know, to see that student athletes come to the park district to participate in some of our events is awesome. Oh, there's good. no no doubt the the guys from Joliet Catholic say that they have the premier uh, football stadium in the state that they get to play at. Yeah, it's an amazing transformation what happened at Joliet Memorial Stadium over the past few years. Okay. And I'm sure with this uh, unbelievably cold and snowy weather, the people can't wait to get outside. And I, I would expect that people would love to come to the Taste on a hot summer night. And, yeah. and that's gearing up already for that, aren't you? Yeah, as we sit here in a cold February night, uh, we're getting ready for the 2014 Taste of Joliet. we got a great weekend planned, so you know anybody that wants to come out will have a great time this year, I guarantee it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Tom. I'm here with Art Schultz. Art, what, what class are you? 1980, I believe. <laughs> 1980, yes, I was. Class of 80. <laughs> and... Uh, you seem to always, whenever we reflect about Joliet Catholic, uh, and you, your kids have gone here, and your wife, and, and it's just, uh, it, it's always great memories. Even though you're in the community, it brings some memories back when you Yes, it does. Uh, my father graduated here, my uh, sisters graduated here, my wife graduated here, uh, my brother, uh, yeah, we're a big uh, Joliet Catholic family. So, Art, I know you're involved with the Joliet Park District on the board level, and um, we were just talking to Dominic about how how many employees in the summer months you hire, and and the kids that come from from Joliet Catholic for part time work just just have great work ethic. And they do, they really do. It's uh, you know Joliet Catholic, is, it's a big family. You know, we're part of that family too, and that's what we want. We want the Joliet Catholic people. You know, in the in the, in the Joliet Central and Joliet West and all that oh, kind sure. of stuff. Great community. You know, it's a great community. Joliet has a great community. All the kids, you know, uh, we put a lot of them to work during the summertime, and it's a fantastic uh, opportunity. And I'm I'm happy to be part of that uh, with the Joliet Park District that we can get all our high school kids around, you know, to go, uh, put them to work too. So it's fantastic. Thank all right, great. Enjoy the evening. We're going to try and get Zinger over here. Well, thank you to very follow much. Up. Thank you. Okay, we're with Jeff Buds, the principal and CEO at Joliet Catholic, and we're not even sure. We're trying to find out what year the banquet is. Forty, somewhere between forty and eight hundred. I think sure. so. I think so, between forty and eight hundred, exactly. So point. it looks like you got a great crowd here, and uh, why don't you tell us about where the money from the alumni events goes to help? Well, the alumni event helps with uh, scholarships for our, our future students, mm -hmm. and also with projects that are, that are happening at JCA. Uh, we're working on a capital initiative right now with our Heritage Quad and windows for the for the building. So we're really putting that, a lot of work into that initiative, and a lot of money from this event will go towards that. The, our alumni association has been fantastic with giving money towards the projects we put forward here at JCA. That's fantastic. And uh, the upcoming um, season after this winter is has come around, we're probably looking forward to some some good baseball here at JCA. I think if the winter ever ends, <laughs> we'll have good baseball here. Yeah, we have a lot of kids coming back from last year's championship team. So it's, it's very exciting to see. Uh, uh, Coach Foss is a very young team, and uh, I think we'll we'll uh, make the papers again this year. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Larry. Okay, we're talking with Paul Azing, or Zinger, as everybody refers to you as. Um, so tell us, how, how did you get to Joliet, Illinois for this banquet? And that's a fair question. Being a Florida boy, 50 of my 54 years. It wasn't the weather, I assume. <laughs> no, no one. But my good friend Terry Gannon sure. worked at ESPN. Class of 81. Camp. Class of 81. Yeah, also. it still has the record, I think, for the most uh, three-pointers oh. ever, like when he was at NC State. He's, he's such a good friend. I'd do anything for T. And uh, he's over at Sochi covering the Olympics right now, and he asked me if I would come do this several months ago, and I said I'd be glad to. So that's why I'm here. 
Well, you're you're joining a proud t tradition. We've had you know a lot of Hall of Famers come and speak. We're trying to still figure out what year it is. If it's the 40th or the 80th, we're not sure how many yeah. banquets they've had. They've had so much, and the money from the alumni goes to to projects, capital projects, to help. Um, scholarships for future students, so we're, we're proud to have you about that. That's fantastic. So tell us a little bit about the book you wrote. Which one? The, the, I wrote two books. No, the, the, the latest one. Cracking the Cracking Code. Cracking the Code. Yeah, I wrote so, a book about the Ryder Cup. Right. I, I read a little bit, uh, and it seems that while the book was penned after the Ryder Cup, the thought was well before that in your mind. Yeah, I spent a lot of time um, you know, thinking about if I was ever captain. And uh, when I was asked to be captain, we'd lost five of the previous six, and I think we'd only won three times in 25 years. We haven't won since I was a captain in 08. And I did come from an outside the box perspective on team building. You know, all you can do as a captain is try to create what you feel sure. is the best environment for them to be successful, and then you kind of got to get out of the way. But the details of what I went through to create the environment are pretty great. And uh, the book did great, it did really well. You can probably buy the book on Amazon for next to nothing now. <laughs> So I'll play a little quick word association and then we'll let you get to the meet and greet, the, the, the reason the people are up here now. Golf. Golf. Oh my gosh, difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be easy. Poker. Uh, man, you know, let's see, word association, poker, difficult. Difficult. It's all difficult. It How is. about foosball? I know that you used to play a lot of foosball. I love it. Real I got that from a guy in the Quad Cities I did. who saw you at the John Deere yeah, Classic. And all yes, the all the time. At the foosball. I love foosball. I love it. No. Uh, Terry Gannon. Great athlete. Uh, your wife. Great person. Mark Grant. Who's that? Mark Grant, the co-host tonight with you. Oh! Is he about that tall? Yes. He's bald-headed. Yes. Big guy. Yes. Never heard of him. <laughs> there you are. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, you got it, man. <laughs> okay, we're speaking with, you can put that down, Sue Goulis, president of the Alumni Association and proud class of 81. Class of 81. Class Woo! of 81 rocks. The, the question everybody wants to know from you is how did you get Paul Azinger here? Uh, well, speaking of class of 81, um, Terry Gannon. Uh, who is an ESPN and golf analyst and NBC broadcaster. Actually, he's over in um, Sochi, Russia doing the Olympics now. Um, I called him, he's a classmate, so I called him last summer and I just said, here's what we want to do. We need to bring the Hilltopper Banquet back in a big way. Who can you get us? And he said, do you want basketball player? Do you want golf? And I said, I think I want golf because Joliet has never had a golfer speaker. We've had football players, we've had baseball. Um, so we've just never had golfer. And um, when Terry offered me the options of who I could have, um, the first thing I did was I called Dave Lucetta at the University of St. Francis. And, um, and I know you're dying to do a, an impersonation. So Dave Lucetta said to me, Anyway, I can help you, buddy. <laughs> We've never had a golfer. We've never had a golfer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Nine months later, here we are. Well, you're known as the best coordinator in town <laughs> of any event. So if you're looking to hire a coordinator, guys, this is the one. Tell us where, where, where do the dollars go from the alumni events? Well, they go right to the Alumni Association, but then we fund a lot of projects and um, scholarships and things at school. Um, a couple years ago, we gave $25,000 to the lighting project here at school. Um, we gave $6,000 last year to the classroom project. We fund six scholarships every year. Um, tuition scholarships and just kind of whatever the school needs. Um, this year they need windows, so we're going to make a donation to that. So, well, it looks like you got a great turnout. I mean, there looks there's got to be 500 seats down there set for, and uh, we hope you have a great event. And we're going to get some more people in here. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. I'm with Dick. We're with Dick Goss now. I know you're dying to take this microphone away from me and 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 do the interview, but we're we're here. No, I don't want to interview you. <laughs> <laughs> Not me, somebody else. Oh, okay. They're very good. <laughs> You've come to cover how many, I, thousands of events in, All, in the jelly. A lot of events, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, this is one of the good ones. I'm just glad to see the banquet back and uh, a guest like Paul Asinger and uh, Mark Grant back again, and he's always hilarious. Oh, yes. He'll be a great time tonight. Another so. class of 81 member, Mark Grant, that is. Yeah, Mark, the old Major League Baseball pitcher who's now doing the color on the Padres games. He's. Uh, he is quite a character, so, so we'll we, have fun tonight. We think this is, as far as we can remember, maybe the first pro golfer we've ever had at one of the, the Joliet events. I think events. so. No, I can't come up with any. I don't yeah. think anybody else has either. It's uh, 
it's really a, a great first because Paul Azinger is a great guy and it, it, people are going to enjoy talking with him tonight. Okay, are you going to get a chance to talk to him? Have you had a chance to talk to him yet? Well, I just said hello and talked to him just a little bit, but I haven't uh, gotten him aside. And uh, of course, a lot of people want to talk to him. Oh yeah, yeah, you may yeah. have some questions. May, you may have some, uh, some competition. For well, thanks time. for covering things yeah. all these years yeah. and it's great to interview you for a change. Well, thank you Have very a great much. evening, Dick. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay, we're here with a fellow First of all, a fellow classmate, class of 81. Mm, most smartest class that ever walked yeah, the Most people do not know this, but Mark and I battled uh, for the Vale of Victoria mm -hmm. until we found out they counted one up, not from the bottom <laughs> down. Yeah, I know. That's a, that's a good point. <laughs> if, if they turned the, uh, in the, uh, the you know, class upside down as far as grade point average, you and I are neck and neck. I think Doug DeJoni still beats us, but we're close. Think? <laughs> so, Mark, you've come back and done this before. Love it. You love, love it. it. How, what kind of feeling do you get when you, you walk in? Family. There? And not only my own family, my mom and dad, which still live in the same house I grew up in, but family as far as seeing guys like you, sure. just yucking it up. I mean, side-splitting stories, laughing and, you know, hurting yourself. They tend to grow each year. Yeah, they, they, they do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and just seeing guys that, you know, you know, Larry, I come back, let's say it's been 10 years, and when I see guys like you and other classmates, even from other classes, it's like we haven't even skipped a beat. No. It's like we just saw each other last week. Absolutely. So it's a good feeling to always come back home and see everybody. And, and everybody just gives so much back to JCA. And that's the one good thing that really sticks out as well. So you have nothing but great memories from your Hilltopper. Great guys. memories, my gosh. You know, it's great to get in good with the teachers because that's how you get good grades. <laughs> but no, it was great. And like I said, you know, not only the classroom and, and learning from great teachers, and the, the atmosphere and the environment, but the friendships that last forever too. That's, that's to me, that's the most valuable thing. So we look like, I was talking, we were talking with uh, Sue Goulis and, and she said, we've got about 500 people coming mm -hmm. tonight. That's great. So it's a great crowd, yeah. it's a great event. And we also were talking with Dick Goss. We believe it may be the first time we've had a golfer at any banquet in Joliet to come and speak. Really? So, so you, you pressure. Well, I know on. there are a lot of guys uh, out there who think they're good golfers. <laughs> And uh, to have somebody like Paul Azinger here who, I mean, you know, that, that, this is a big deal. You, you saying he needs to work on my swing a little yeah, bit? Yeah. I did. Yeah. I asked him. I said, Paul, what, what should I do? He said, stick with racquetball. <laughs> so I, I, it's what I've got going. So Mark, we'll just take another minute. We know we got people. So we'll do a little quick kind of word association. Okay. You told us what Jolly Catholic means. What does baseball mean to you? Great game. Greatest game of all, I think. And um, once again, because of baseball, I developed a lot of great friendships. Padres? World Series winners, 2014. You heard it here first. <laughs> Should I put a wager on uh, Yeah, that? go to Vegas. Put 10 <laughs> bucks down. What, if it's a million to one? Hey, you're looking good. Larry and Sue Grant. Best parents ever in the world. Could not have handpicked two better parents to, uh, to have as mom and dad. Um, right. In fact, you know what? I'm, I'm down in the basement. I come home, and they put me in the basement. You're sleeping <laughs> in the basement. So it's great. I love my mom and dad. Great. They're, they're awesome. Terry Gannon. Who? <laughs> Terry Gannon, class 81. Oh, he, he was my limo driver. He, he picked me up from the airport and, and brought me to uh, brought me in town here. He, is he a good driver? Excellent driver. That's fantastic. Excellent driver. I knew he was going to yeah, be yeah, accomplished. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Paul Azinger, have you had a chance to meet him? Class guy. You know what? In the short time that I've met Paul and talked to him, he's pretty much the whole package. He was a great athlete, yeah. great golfer, great guy, great sense of humor. Author. And, uh, author and any guy who, uh, I mean, he's probably got a great perspective on life as well, being a cancer survivor, which we're probably going to hear about talking I, about we tonight. We are really looking interested to hear him. Yeah, but uh, I'm, you know, I'm honored to be here and to have Paul as our guest. Um, it's, uh, it's just another feather in the cap of G JCA and what they do. Well, it's always great to have you. It's Jared, always a pressure. Buddy. Take care of my It's friend. always a pressure, Jerry. Uh, <laughs> pressure, Larry, not Larry. pleasure. You hear that? <laughs> we can edit that out, can't we? The whole thing. <laughs> okay, we're speaking now with Mark Carner. Mark, class of 80? 83. Oh, 83. Proud. He's yeah. a little younger than I am. But. <laughs> so, just, just, just a little bit. <laughs> so tell, tell us a little about what, what your memories are from, from Joliet Catholic and JCA and, and what it meant to you when you go here. Uh, you, you know what? I had a great time. Uh, I met, uh, I didn't have a lot of friends, but I had a lot of, had a very, I had a lot of close friends. Mm -hmm. um, Played on the soccer, and that was kind of interesting uh, back to, back then because it was a, a new program. That wasn't was the it? new program. Sure. I mean, it was a club sport when I started, oh, wow. and uh, so everybody's kind of looking at us with you know crossed eyes, going, "What are you guys dressed for? <laughs> How come you're not playing football or yes, baseball?" Right. So, but uh, we did were, you explain to them that that's the original football? Exactly. Yeah. It's like this is the real football. Yeah. Okay, it's not you know not the one with the pads and everything. We take full contact Ooh. with no pads. So, uh, but that didn't go over very well. <laughs> but we had a lot of fun. Um, still, uh, 
uh, I've got, I still keep in contact with a lot of those guys. One is a, one of my friends is in Peru, uh, working and acting as a mountain guide. I have another buddy who's working for uh, NASA. Um, oh. And uh, so, class eighty three did, did may, maybe 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 a little better than eighty one. We, we didn't do too bad. Or? We didn't do too bad. So uh, I mean, a lot of us are still in the area. So it's great. So this banquet here, the, we talked to the alumni association. Sue Gould is the president of the alumni. Explain and where the the funds go for this, and they've got a, a, about five hundred people coming in. So it's really a great thing, isn't it? You're involved in a lot of the community things, and 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 th what we know is this is the first time that we've had a golfer. What do you think of that? <laughs> well, Janie was the first person that Sue called. My wife, is Jane, has been golfing since she was six years old. Oh, wow. And uh, we've been following Paul Azinger for decades. So when, uh, when Susie called and said, hey, would you know this guy? And we said, of course we're going to know this guy. <laughs> so absolutely we come. Uh, so we're thrilled that we have a golfer here um, and talking tonight and getting to oh. ask questions and have Mark uh, grill him a little bit. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> did you get to meet Zinger yet? We did. We oh, did. Fantastic. So very nice man. Fantastic. So very nice did he man. give you some golf tips yet? I, 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 I'm too embarrassed to even ask for yeah, those. There you go. Okay, because as many that he would give me, they're still not going to work. <laughs> well, have a great time. Thank you, Larry. Thank you for your time. Mike. Okay, we're talking with Mike Bruno. You know, the best part of this banquet is not everybody's an alum. It's an alumni banquet. We bring people from all over. Mike Bruno is uh, Marion Catholic class of 1980. Ooh, that was a good class. Danny, <laughs> did, we, did we kick their butt that year? Do you remember? Uh, I don't, I think they did. We lost six to nothing mm. in the yeah, prep bowl hey, semifinals. Yeah, Johnny, Johnny, Johnny Querio. I sacked Fitzgerald. I remember <laughs> that. So <laughs> <laughs> who didn't? <laughs> so have you come to these banquets before? I have quite yeah. often yeah. in many many years. I'm, I grew up in Chicago Heights. I've sure. either worked or lived in Joliet for the last. 23 years so so you've been involved in the community it looks yes. like we got a i don't know if it's a record crowd but we got about 500 tonight that's outstanding and from what we know it's the first time in any of the joliet uh, sporting uh, alumni events that we've had a golfer as a uh, as a guest speaker well i think a lot of that has to do with uh, ex-alums so oh yes, yes i think he's calling the olympics right now that that's probably right. had a lot Terry, to do Terry with, had a lot to do with that it, so. cardiac kid with north so, carolina state so. so that's fantastic so we we bring our friends from marion catholic i'm not sure if there's any brother rice guys here but i'm not sure if i want to interview them anyway well i've been adopted so <laughs> thank I you appreciate mike it. thank you take care thank you 70? All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we've got Ed Perry here, the uh, the trumpeteer, trumpist. What's, what's the proper terminology? Trumpeter. He played our school's loyalty. He's going to play it one more time. If you want to sing along, feel free, sing along. But here's Eddie again, fast Eddie on the trumpet. Nicely done, Ed. Big round of applause for Ed. At this time, I would like to introduce a dear friend of mine. She's working very, very hard to put this event on with her committee. She is the president of the JCA Alumni Board. She was also a class, one of the members of the greatest class to ever, to ever walk the halls of SFA, JCHS, the class of 81. She just got out of prison. If you look on the back, there's a number, 139-2537. And uh, she's out on parole right now. Nice outfit, Sue. Sue Goulis. She's out busting up rocks in the back. She had a little time to talk. Sue's. Oh, yeah, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, by the way, she's got a little assistance, a little stool to talk. Here you go. Let me get that for you. That's better. Okay. You got it? Yeah. I can't believe this day is finally here. Long time in the planning. 
It is so cool to see a, such a full house. Good evening and welcome back to the Hilltopper Banquet. We are fortunate to come together again as a community that now dates back 145 years. JCA is strong and getting stronger, a fact that we should give thanks to in an era when Catholic schools face great challenges, some of, which, some of which recently resulted in the announcement of the closing of Mount Assisi Academy. Football fans, don't get too excited. I said Mount Assisi, not Montini. Oh, hey -oh. Tonight we bring back the alumni banquet as we all knew and loved it. Over the last several years, this event has been through more formats than the number of teams Mark Grant has been traded to. Oh, hey now. Who could forget the year though, although we're trying to forget it, that we brought in the nun from late night catechism, a night so bad, someone is spending time in purgatory, Tim Plaker. But tonight we're going old school for our alma mater. We've got a full house and a very special guest speaker. Thanks to a classmate, our friend, and fellow alum, Terry Gannon, we have PGA and Ryder Cup champion, Paul Azinger here with us. Unfortunately, Terry couldn't join us for the fun. He's in Sochi, Russia, covering the ice skating for NBC's Olympic coverage. He was really sorry he couldn't be here, but he said he'd rather watch ice skating than listen to Mark Grant's old jokes. Oh. <laughs> wow. Another one. <laughs> a few years ago, we removed the awards portion of the Hilltopper Banquet, and we made it a separate event. In your programs, there's a save the date, for the 2014 Alumni Awards Dinner, which will be held Thursday, March 27th at the Jacob Henry Mansion. Although we are not presenting awards tonight, I'd like to announce and acknowledge our 2014 award winners. Uh, I think, I know at least three of them are here. So um, when I call your name, please stand. The recipient of our 2014 Alumnus of the Year is Jane McGrath Schmig, class of 76. I don't know if she's here. She was coming late, I don't know if she's here yet. The recipient of the Career Achievement Award is Will County State's Attorney Jim Glasgow, Class of 68. Is he here? The recipient of the Sister Anna Marie Becker Service Award are Harry McSteen, Class of 81, and his wife Marilyn. I know Harry's here. The recipient of the Reverend Patty McGowan Award is our head vars varsity baseball coach, Jared Voss, class of 92. And the 2014 JCA Honorary Alumnus of the Year goes to Luann Roth. I don't think she's. All of the award winners will be formally presented with their awards and honored at the Alumni Awards Dinner on March 27th. Everyone is welcome, um, but it is a sit-down dinner, so re reservations are required. Um, the information's in your programs, and invitations go out next, within the next week. An event like this doesn't happen without two things, sponsors and volunteers. I'd like to thank our generous sponsors who are shown here um, on the signs on our wall and also listed in your program. In addition to our event sponsors, our in-kind donors are equally as important in making this event a success. So we would like to thank our in-kind donors as well. If that's not enough, I think we all know that in order to run an event like this, you need volunteers. I'd like to thank our 40 plus volunteers who have willingly given their time, except the ones that I twisted their arm, to work a position tonight. We have volunteers from the current alumni board, past alumni board, JCA faculty administration and staff. In addition, um, there's a few spouses that had their arms twisted to be here. Uh, mine for one, he's a JT grad, class of 79. He's a steelman, so we have a steelman at the bar. <laughs> anyway, thank you to all of our volunteers. And last but not least, thank you to our featured speaker for leaving sunny Florida for Siberia. Uh, Paul, you wanted to see snow and icicles, so I hope you're happy. 
And Mark Grant, what can I say? Thank you for answering the call to help get the Hilltopper Banquet back off the ground. Thank you, uh, on a personal note, I have to say this into the camera because I know this is being taped and I know these two classmates will have the opportunity to see this full program on DVD. Ed Dollinger, we miss you and we cannot believe you are not here. Terry Gannon, on behalf of the Alumni Board and for me personally, thank you for everything you did to get this off the ground. And now I'd like to introduce our principal and CEO, Mr. Jeff Buds, to say a few words. And my last chance, <laughs> Class of 81 rocks. Do you need the stool? Uh, you, need uh, you need the stool. <laughs> I thought that would be kind of nice to do, but. There you go. <laughs> welcome, welcome once again to our Hilltopper Banquet. Um, we truly appreciate you being here tonight. Before I give a little bit of an update of our school, and I won't be too long, I know uh, there are many people that are hungry in this room, so I'll be qu uh, quick with my points. Um, and some thank yous. Uh, first of all, obviously, thank you to Sue Goulis and the Alumni Association for all of their hard work. Uh, a year and a half in the making and just uh, really tirelessly working. I think I, uh, Sue's on the payroll now at JCA with all the time she's spent here, so thank you once again to Sue Goulis and the Alumni Association. To Sue Bibar, our, our alumni director of all her hard work also. Um, uh, Sue and Sue work very well together and uh, once again this could not have happened without their, uh, their tireless efforts. Uh, Mr. Mark Grant, um, I, I hear a lot about this uh, gentleman and all the good things he uh, is going to say tonight. I'm, I'm glad uh, uh, that uh, Sue got some shots in on him. I'm sure that uh, he'll dish them back to Sue. Um, I hope I'm not on his list. He doesn't really know me that well. so. Uh, I'll put a preemptive strike into saying to Mr. Grant, uh, you know, keep me off the list. <laughs> no, uh, but thank you, Mr. Grant, for being here tonight. Uh, Mr. Paul Azinger, thank you for taking time out of your schedule for being here. Um, it should be a great uh, talk later on in our program. Tonight's sponsors, uh, as Sue said, we cannot do without you and all our volunteers. We truly appreciate um, all of our donors and sponsors and our volunteers. And finally, thank you to you um, for your support of JCA. Uh, support of this event and for being here tonight. We have a packed crowd and it's just great to see. Just a quick update of our school and uh, some things that are happening here at JCA. Uh, there are exciting times, exciting times at JCA. Um, there has been a tremendous increase in scholarship dollars and endowment dollars to help future angels and hillmen come through our doors and that's thanks to you and to your donations over the years. And this year we've been just uh, uh, incredibly um, a lot more scholarship dollars have come through, so we truly appreciate that. Also, with our new strategic plan, uh, we have uh, plans to uh, give a facelift to the school with a heritage quad. You might have seen the rendition out in the hallway, talked to John Horn, our development director, or myself. Um, that's a very exciting project to bring the past schools together, uh, De La Salle and St. Francis Academy and Joliet Catholic High School, and all their uh, tradition and heritage and charism to our school and, and to teach future classes of what made JCA. So that will be um, uh, coming soon, and hopefully also we are going to have uh, the windows replaced in our whole building um, this spring and summer. So we are very excited about our future plans here at JCA. Also, future projects include research library and a chapel and uh, hopefully an all-purpose uh, all turf field in the back. So exciting times at JCA. And once again, we couldn't do it without your support. So I truly appreciate, I truly appreciate all that you have given to JCA and to uh, the schools in the past. Thank you. Uh, this time I'd like to introduce Father Jack Welch for our invocation. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Loving God, we have grateful hearts this evening. We thank you for the presence of each one here and your presence in our lives. Please watch over our families and friends. We thank you for the faith of the Franciscan sisters, the Christian brothers, and the Carmelite fathers and brothers. Their faith led to founding St. Francis Academy, De La Salle High School, and Joliet Catholic High School. These schools are the foundation for today's Joliet Catholic Academy. The same faith present in those schools is present today in the classrooms and hallways of JCA. Lord, we ask that you bless the students at JCA, their teachers, administration, and staff. 
Bless our time together this evening. May it be a celebration of faith and heritage. And may our efforts also help the young angels and hillmen receive the same foundation in life we received. And let's pray together. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts which we are about to receive in thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of Mount Carmel. St. Francis of Assisi. Go Hill. I like that. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jeff. Hold on. Grab some buds. Oh, really? Hey, Riley, way to walk in through the prayer. Awesome. Nice Catholic education that you learned. That's awesome. Atheist. Um, we have two lovely ladies. I'm not going to get sued for saying that right in this day and age of PC. Lovely ladies. I'm not going to get in trouble, am I? On either side of the room, they're going to release the tables in an orderly fashion, okay? No forearm shivering to the Mastacholi and that, okay? Uh, in the buffet line. So, which side are they going to do? After the head table here? Yeah, we're going to I'm not going to eat, so I'm going to, I'm just going to. Yeah, drink. In the meantime, while waiting for your table, please visit our raffle table. If you have not visited the raffle table, there's a lot of stuff going on over there that uh, you can take home tonight, and we appreciate everybody's generosity. We've got some cool stuff. A chair slash ottoman for your man cave at home. Autograph Indianapolis Colts. Kobe Fleener. Is Shelly here? Is Shelly? Shelly Nagel? Where's Shelly? Yeah, I clapped too. Believe me. How you doing? Where's she at? Shelly, where are you? Shelly, what's up? Uh, her son, Kobe Fleener, plays for the Indianapolis Colts, number 80. Yeah, he's had a heck of a career, two years uh, with the Colts. So, autographed football from Kobe. Golf foursomes, silver victory like keychain. Everybody needs a victory like tie tack, a, a spirit basket, golf lessons from PGA professional, uh, stainless steel cooler. We've got all a bunch of stuff over there. So the drum will be after dinner and before the program. So get your tickets and all that good stuff. Okay, so with that said, sit back, have a cocktail, have some good food, and they will release the tables right now, right? Yeah, they're, gonna, they're waiting for us. And they're waiting for us. Okay, you guys can go. I'm not going to eat. And then uh, sit back. And, are you guys, oh, here's our lovely ladies over here. And Tim Riley, everybody. <laughs> Enjoy dinner. We'll be back in a little bit. Have some fun. See some new faces, see some old faces, see some very old faces, see some extremely old faces. And it's just great to be here because I love my job, I love coming back and doing this, but there's one thing about my job that I hate before we get into our guests, and that's the pregame show. I hate doing the pregame show. Love my job, love going to the ballpark. I think everybody has a pregame show in their vocation, if you were to ask somebody. One certain point that you really dislike. Mine is the pregame show. This is not a pregame show, I love doing it, and I'm happy to be here once again. Thanks to Susie for inviting me, appreciate it. So people in the crowd here, do we have a table of nuns here tonight? Do we have some nuns? Seriously, I think Susie told me that there was a table of nuns here. If you are, can you raise your hands? We'd like to recognize you. Where are they at? No? No? Are you back there? They stuck you way in the back? Why, is it cooler back there? Is that the penguin section? Yeah? It's nice and cool back there. Nice. Hey, we have some, hey, if you were an SFA angel, please stand up. SFA angels, be, be recognized. Stand up. Yeah. Miss Riley. Oh, yeah, we got some in the back there. Hey, shouldn't you ladies be somewhere playing bunko tonight or something? Seriously. Don't you have a bunko game soon somewhere? No? By the way, bunko is a Greek word that says gossip. Did you know that? Class of 59 is here. Welcome, gentlemen. Where's 59? Raise your hands. If you can, raise your hands. Seriously, where are you guys? Verse 59. There you go. One guy's got his arm up. Good. Hey, guys, move around a little bit or else he'll start throwing dirt on you. Go. Move around a little bit. There you go. 
It's good to see you back, seriously. Love the old class, there you go. It's good to see you. that's what it's all about, the brotherhood, the brothership right over there. Classmates, 1959, appreciate it. Mike Sasso was class 59, he's not here tonight, but his daughter Sheila's here, representing Mike Sasso, so Sheila give us a wave. SFA, class of 85, she's back there. Uh, class of 80, class of 80, where are you? Yeah, hey, I'd like to welcome everybody. Class of 80, they moved to Colorado and Washington. It's good to have you back. It's good to have you back. Once they pass that law, Class of 80, Seattle, Illinois, Colorado, Washington, unbelievable. You know, there, there's always been a battle between Class of 80 and 81. I'll tell you this. The Class of 81 beat you guys in GPA. All right? No doubt about it. But you guys beat us in BAL, blood alcohol level. You guys had a speak there. So welcome from, um, in fact, remember Partners in Learning? Remember how tired that was? For the class of 80, it was Partners in Burning. hey -o. yeah. You like that one? Live Fool Golly. I, I smell fumes, my golly. Live Fool Golly over class of 81. Speaking of 81, I gotta represent my table here. Joe Whalen here. Uh, Gabby Bellucci. How you doing, Gabby? Is it Gabby or Gabby? I always call you Gabby. Gabby? G Gabby's a dentist. And uh, I went in there once for a cleaning, and she was cleaning my teeth, and she, all of a sudden she goes, Want to buy a watch? Want to buy a necklace? Get it? The jewelry store thing? That's great. I'd like to welcome the uh, Durantes, the Saminos, the Falados, the Egizios, the Galafalos. Hey, leave the gun, take the canolas. Right? I better be nice or else I'm going to have a horse's head in my bed tonight. Uh, with that said, I think, uh, oh, the oldest class member is Mr. Is Paul Merriman from the class of 43? Is he here? Is there a Mr. Merriman here? Paul Merriman? Well, anyway, if he's here, Mr. Merriman, class of 43, welcome. Probably the oldest classmate here, so that's awesome. Is he here? No? Class of 80 had 16 people here. Is uh, Scott Martley here tonight? No? All right. Well, one more thing before we get to our guest speaker. You know, as I was getting off the plane in Chicago, this baseball right here, it came shooting out of the sky, like re-entry, you know what I mean? Where's Mike Pezzavetto? Pez, here's the ball Jeff Reed hit off at the athletic field. Back in 80, it finally came down, so you can take that home for a souvenir, all right? Awesome. I am so glad to be here tonight, and one of the luxuries, and one of the reasons why I'm very lucky is because I get to meet people in the sporting world, and tonight, we have a special guest with us. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. I know we all know it's all a lot easier, but just introduce a little bit. He's from Holy Oak, Massachusetts. People from Massachusetts are usually called mass holes. Do you hear that? That's what they usually call them. He attended Florida State. He's been on the PGA Tour uh, when he was playing actively since 1982. He has 12 wins, including a uh, 1993 victory PGA Championship, a major, which is uh, quite an accomplishment. We're going to talk about that. Absolutely. He has also had the opportunity to play on four U.S. Ryder Cup teams. 1993, kind of life took a turn on him, and we all know about what happened to, uh, to Paul after winning the major. He was diagnosed with uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in his right shoulder in December of 1993. He's uh, affectionately known as Zinger. He's got a great personality. He's quite a talented individual. He's got a couple books out. One is Cracking the Code, The Winning Ryder Cup Strategy, Make It Work For You. Um, just an all-around good guy. If it wasn't for Terry Gannon, Paul would not be here. So once again, Class of 81 coming through. Once again, Class of 81, what have you done like that? Anyway. Um, so anyway, with that said, ladies and gentlemen, give a big JCA, Joliet, Illinois welcome to Mr. Paul Azinger.
Yeah, you can stand. What's up, Zinger? I'm not going to say anything. What's that? Thank you. No, 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 no. Thank you very much. I thought it was going to be cold here. This is mic's going out. Is it mine going out? Can you hear me all right? Ready to hear me? No, no, no. Go ahead. Okay, we'll fix that. <laughs> um, before they start, we have one more classmate that wants to say a few words. Roll the tape. Roll the ugliness. Oh, is it T Gannon? You got to get down. Get down. Oh. Hey everybody, wish I were there. Terry Gannon, class of 1981 with you. Unfortunately, I'm out here in the desert, Palm Springs area. By the time you guys are where you are right now, I'll be over in Russia doing the Olympics. But I just wanted to say, I really wish I could be there right now. And you've got two of the great all-time guys there. You're in good hands. You've got Mark Grant, also class of 1981, used to scare us all with his 97-mile-an-hour fastball, better known as Gase. Make sure you have him do an impression or two. And um, if he doesn't keep you entertained, I know Zinger will. Paul, one of my great friends here in golf, we've gone around the world together. Ask him about the time. He thought it was a rehearsal, but it really wasn't. We were on the air at the British Open and ask him about Seve. Uh, other than that, i got one more guy who wants to say hello and wish his best. Right over here. Hey, Zing. <laughs> Whatever you do, just don't talk to them about the grip, but and but do oh, tell them how man. wonderful I am, how lovely, and how much you love me and respect me. You know, apart from that, I'm very happy. But I will give you credit that driver off the deck you hit at the 15th hole at the Belfry when you partner Chip Beck against me and Woozy and you beat us because you were 13 under par for 15 <laughs> holes. It was a pretty good shot, mate. I'll give you that much. So when he talks about how great you are, it's about 10 seconds. What's he got the rest of the night? That's all, that's all he's got for you. Nick Faldo out here. <laughs> Terry Gannon. I wish, Zinger, I'll take 10 seconds. Wow. I, I wish I could be there. Have a great night, guys. I'm, I'm glad I'm not. Zing, thank you. Gase, go get him. Thank you. See you guys. Hey, that's really cool. That's very cool, huh? So, if you want to know, Faldo and I are like this. This is me, and this is Faldo. Right? <laughs> Let's get started. Hey, here, here's Terry Gannon. Here's Terry Gannon tonight. He sent me this text message. He's in Sochi. I don't know if you can see that. That's a guy on the left. Can you see that outfit he's wearing? You see? No? I'm oh sorry. Gosh. Should we clean that up? Look at that. Holy smoke. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> hey, you know what, Paul? First of all, what do you think of our, our great town, Joliet, the J? I can't believe our mics aren't working. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I told Sue I wanted to see snow so bad. Last time I saw snow was last year in March in, uh, in Germany. And Sue was so freaked out that, that I wasn't going to make it up here because of the weather. And I know it was 50 degrees colder mm -hmm. about a week ago. Um, but I, I've lived 50 years of my life in Florida. And truthfully, last night when I walk outside, I'm saying the casino is easily the coldest I've ever seen a temperature in my life. I think it was like 16 or 17 degrees. I've never seen that before in my life. 50 years of my 54 years, I've lived in Florida. So I'm pretty much a weather wuss. That's, that's it, the bottom line. But it is great to be here. Uh, I miss Terry Gannon. Uh, he's such a great guy. I can't believe what a great guy he is. He still has the NCAA record for most three-pointers in a season. And this is where he cut his teeth. And the cool thing is, he was the best pitcher to ever come out of. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He was the best pitcher. Ever. You know what? I, I, oh, by the way, by the way, I googled your name. Did you? This is like Mark Grant. Oh yeah, Mark Grant. About this tall, bald-headed guy. <laughs> Never heard of him. So I google Mark Grant, and up comes Mark Grant, murderer. That is one of the Mark Grants. If I google your name, he's like. So I wonder if it's that guy. Finally got out, huh? Yeah, got out. You no, know, it's like a bunch of you. I think golfers are wussies, quite frankly. Oh, really? Yeah. Why is that? Oh, shh. Be quiet. Oh, he's putting. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, baseball. I can't play my foul ball. Oh, really? Oh, wait. I'm a pitcher. I work once every five days. Oh, I get to wear a jock strap. <laughs> who, is, who is the first person to put a club in your hand? A club? Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's another story later, but go ahead. Yeah, my oh. parents played, I played golf my whole life since I was little. I never actually broke 70 until my second year of college. 
And I just worked hard, you know, I went to Brevard Junior College. I was probably the third best player on the C team. I remember my first ever tournament, I shot 86, 77, 86, my first college tournament. And I was so happy because I shot 77. When Tiger was that age, he'd already shot, you know, 11 under or something. So, I don't know, I, I, I kind of, I, I was a late bloomer. I played when I was young. When I was in high school, you know, none of my friends played golf. I didn't play much golf. You were a geek. You, you were a geek. geek. Like, I remember when I was growing up, I mean, golf really didn't hit its prime or its stride until, like, maybe a little later. But, you know, I, I know there's a lot of people in this room that can say, if you golfed, you were a geek back in the day. I mean, don't well, you think? I'll just say I just beat the living snot out of about 20 baseball players. <laughs> so, just so you know. No, that's true, though. Golf wasn't cool. Golf's yeah. a lot cooler now. Uh, it's more accepted. Golfers are athletes, and, and uh, it's, a di it's a different era. But the era before me, those guys were drinking vodka and orange juice. And my generation, I got on tour in 82, and we started drinking orange juice instead of vodka and orange juice. And these guys now are drinking power drinks and working out like crazy. They're fitness fanatics. Tiger moved the bar. He made it okay. It's kind of like, a, who's the first basketball player to really work out where it was okay? That's a good question because I can't answer. Did that. you do steroids, dude? I mean, I did not think I did because if somebody offered it to me, I would have been dumb enough to do it. Oh hell yeah, yeah I'm not afraid of it. Done it too. I got, I got. If somebody came to me and said, you know what? Hey, you want to gain five miles an hour on your fa on your fastball? You know, you're on the bubble. It's either him or you on the team. You want to try to get a little help? I would have been. And I, I'm stupid enough to say, yeah, you know what? I'm all ears. And I thank God that nobody ever approached me. We can see your ears too, buddy. And plus, I like my sex life too much. That's why I don't want to do it. I looked up some ball jokes on the internet, but I'm not going to use them. No, no, nah, okay. I don't feel like it. But um, go, what was the turning point when you, you know, you're golfing, right? And I'm sure you have no aspirations of being on the PGA Tour. What was the turning point where it said, you know what, it's clicking. Paul Azinger is going to, you know, try to make a, a career out of this. It's hard. I mean, it's hard to define how that happened, really. I mean, I just, uh, the, I started winning tournaments my second year of college. I mean, I literally couldn't, I couldn't make the team. To the, I spent a summer at Arnold Palmer's Golf Academy, and uh, we hosted, oh, I don't know, maybe 100 or 120 campers from the ages of 12 to 17. Every two weeks, they'd come in, and I stayed one summer for eight weeks at Bay Hill, and lived right there in a the hotel there on the golf course. I was making 80 bucks a week, and we would pick these kids up at the uh, airport and work with them for two weeks and ship them out. And there was eight pros and eight. I was like considered a counselor. Eight pros, eight counselors. We were just. We were just gophers, basically, for the pros. But I got really good, and when I went back to school, I was the best player on the team. And Brevard Junior College, we had an incredible golf team. I mean, it was unbelievable. We had guys shooting in the 60s on the C team the first year I was there. Quite a team. I just worked hard. I had a lot of balls. Coach Suddy, you guys know Coach Suddy? He was here at uh, Cog Hill, fantastic. He was my golf coach at the time. And uh, I remember the first time I saw my swing on video, I looked at him, I said, it looks pretty good, huh, Coach? And study so this classic coach for me. He goes, well, Paul, you're across the line. You're past parallel. You're on your left side at the top. You got no leg action, and your club face is dead shut. <laughs> Where do we start, coach? <laughs> so, I, you know, I really didn't. I was terrible. I mean, I just was terrible. But I worked hard, and then I won a couple tournaments when I went to Florida State. And, uh, you know, by the way, I was out of the country during the national championship. You know, I never did see who won that. But <laughs> never mind. Never mind. Win. Never mind, never mind. Florida State. So, Seminoles? Yeah, can you believe that? Was, was there any point? Was that a school? Did anybody think Florida State could win that game at any point? Those of you who watched it? No? Nobody watched it? I watched it. Right. I mean, what in the hell? You know what? I, never mind. I'm not going to say it. Um, so, anyway, I, I finally I went to tour school, and I ended up making it my first try, and it was kind of a fluke, right. Mark. It really was. But I made it. I lost my car. I played the mini tours for a year. And uh, I played great on the mini tours, but I felt like it was weird. I, in my mind, I felt like I've been on tour a year. I didn't know who the mini tour players were, and I, re and I just was confident. And I realized after my success on the mini tour, I went back to the tour, and my confidence completely went away because now I'm against guys that I've watched on TV my whole life. And that's when it hit me that golf is really a mental game. And the, the mental aspect of the sport is as significant as the f physical aspect. I mean, in golf, there's this convergence in the artist and the engineer. And uh, you, you have to be able to blend both. You have to be able to be visual. You have to deal with the pressure. Um, you have to, you know, when your heart beats so hard, you can feel your pulse in your fingertips. Mm -hmm. You've got to control that in golf. It's not like if you're on the mound, I suppose, if you're feeling that, you know, maybe you're feeding off the adrenaline and you can throw it through the catcher and maybe, you know, but in golf, you just cannot let that get a hold of you. So you have to somehow figure out how to, how to slow your heart rate down and 
Tom Watson said a long time ago, he never learned how to win golf tournaments until he learned how to control his breathing. And when he slowed down his breathing, it was like in four counts real slow, out four counts real slow. He could slow down his heart rate and he was conscious of his walking pace. And I was the kind of guy that, you know, I delved way into all that stuff. I read a lot of books on, on concentration and visualization and all that. And then eventually I kept my card. Then I won tour school uh, one year. I won tour school, then I kept my card. And then, you know, I just kept going like this. Mm -hmm. And in 1987, you know, it all just started to happen. I won three times. I won my first ever tournament. Now, now when you get to that point around the upline, do you say to yourself, do you try to, try to blank it out and you know, ask yourself, hey, why am I doing this? Or is it just like you're a, uh, you're a, uh, a, a horse coming down with the blinders on and you got one thing in mind and nothing can distract you? What was it like on the climb? Why, why am I so good right now? Did you think about it? Did it get inside your head? Or did you just say, you know what, I'm going to ride it out? Well, I had a moment happen to me in 1987 when, after I won my first tournament. You know, during the climb, I was, I was broke. I mean, I still owe like $35,000 to sponsors and, and stuff. And uh, my wife and I, we got married before I got, actually got on tour. And I, we lived in a motor home for four years, a 24-foot camper. I mean, Tin Cup. Yeah, yeah. just like Tin Cup, except his was probably nicer. So, <laughs> uh, but we had a cat and uh, nothing else. And um, I, I just never, I don't, you know, I wasn't really thinking too much about the money. My dad kept saying it's not about the money. It's a game of one. You're, if your if your average is one shot lower a year, you'll make you know a fortune and blah blah blah. So that's kind of how I thought about it. But when I finally did win, I won the Phoenix Open in 1987. The defining moment, probably in the rest of my career, happened on the third green at Pebble Beach. Bert Yancey, many of you probably have never heard of, but what a terrific player he was, and he kind of mentored me a little bit. And Bert had, uh, he was bipolar, he was on medication, he did oh, a lot well, of not. Yeah, Go ahead. Okay. But he did a lot of weird things, you know, and, and people steered away from Bert, but I gravitated towards the guy for some reason because I, I, re I recognized his mind, he was brilliant in his mind. And so he walks up to me on the third green after I win Phoenix, I'm playing a practice match with my caddy and I, and he comes up and he talked uncomfortably close. And this particular day, for whatever reason, he's on the golf course wearing a bandana around his neck, so like perfect. Like, and he always talked a little too close to you. And he came up to me. Oh, I hate that. I hate that. Yeah, close talker. So he's, he, he says, hey, congratulations. Just so I talk, congratulations on winning the Phoenix Open. I said, oh, man, thanks, Bert. You know, so Bert used to time me. Bert used to watch me hit. And uh, so he was happy. And he just, congratulations. And I said, thanks, man. He says, are you going to play the British Open? The very next sentence. And I thought, I don't know. I mean, I never even considered the British opener beyond what just happened the day before. And I said, I don't know, Bert. I said, I have no idea. He said, son, you can win all the Phoenix Opens you want, but you can't make history unless you win a major. And if you don't play the British Open, you cut yourself out of 25% of the major championships. Because there's four majors in golf. Mm -hmm. And it just stunned me. And I was still in debt. And he left, he walked off, and I stood there with my caddy and I chilled, and I just couldn't get out of my head. And when I walked from the third green to the fourth tee, my goal was to try to make history. And in my mind, I could only do it if I won a major. And that was the, that was the turning moment in my golf mm -hmm. career. I changed, I, all of a sudden, it wasn't about money anymore. Right. And I outworked, you know, I always had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder, because like Fowler always teases me about my grip or whatever, but you know, you can grip it anywhere from here all the way over here. Every player on tour has figured out how to hold off a hook. And the reason we can hit a hook is because our body moves correctly. It moves and flows correctly to the left, like swearing an axe to a tree. You just, your body moves like you should in a golf swing. And, and if I draw like, there's a line on the stage right here, I don't know if you can see it or not, but if you put a golf ball on that line, every good player's pivot is on this side of the line. Every poor player's pivot is on this side of the line. You get that? You guys with me so far? I got it. Okay, so everybody's good. So once you can get your divot on this side of the line, you can hit a hook. Every player on tour has fights a hook at some point in their life, and they all learn how to hold it off. And it doesn't matter what your grip looks like. You hold it off like this or like this, but if you get to the tour, you figure out how to hold that hook, how to hold the hook off. Okay, so now you fast forward. You mentioned winning a major. 1993 comes along. You talk about life throwing a curveball, but you know, being on top of the mountain, winning the, the major, was it Inverness? Yes. The PGA? Yeah. You win that in 93. Talk That's about it, you're just going to skip all the way to that? Well, I, I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff. There, 
Yeah, but you know, when, when you like when you're doing interviews, you're supposed to take part of the answer. It kind of like you mentioned that was a big part of uh, what the, yeah. the, the winning. Uh, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. You, you want to talk about what other stuff? stuff? No, not really. Hanging out at the bars and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Q school one time. Uh, uh, no, winning the PGA was huge for me. I had this ridiculous streak of golf that lasted probably seven years. And I, you know, I played tour. I played the tour for 28 years. And I'm going to be honest. I mean, I was really, really good for only about 10 of the 28 years. The other 18, I'm probably still really good, but I wasn't what I was for that 10-year stretch. I kept my card though, so I was good enough to keep my card. But I wasn't. A, I, I became a non-threat after I got sick. After I did the I had the non Hodgkin's lymphoma, six months chemo, and all that radiation. But going into the PGA, I had uh, I had ten top threes in ten months. I had like three or four wins in ten months. And now I'm coming to the PGA, and I was confident. You know, I was I was really confident. And when it happened, I won in a playoff. I could have very easily not won that tournament. I remember lifting the trophy, and my shoulder hurt so bad, and there was this mm. biopsy was looming, and I mean, it was just the weirdest almost surreal moment. I did it, I felt the relief of doing it, and then like two months later, you know, I'm in the fetal position and they're pulling bone marrow out of my hip, you know, to see if cancer spread and stuff. And it, it was life changing. I mean, I was never, you know, like I said, I kind of had that chip on my shoulder because it was, oh, you know, because I had the grip and everybody else on orthodox looking, I was like, oh, he's good enough to keep his, you know, to get his car, but can he keep it? Oh yeah, he kept it, but can he win? Oh yeah, he won, can he win again? Oh yeah, but can he win a major? It never ends. And that's why life is, really, isn't it? It just never ends. It just keeps going and going. The burden of proof, you know? And once I got sick and I came back, I kind of lost the chip. And, and then after, the burden of proof was gone. But then uh, it, I began to realize people were always going to ask me for the rest of my life, hey, what percent back are you? Hey, how you feeling? How you feeling? And after a couple of years, it occurred to me, if I don't win another tournament, I will have never made it back in everyone's mind. And so I just had to do it. So I, sort of that little chip came, came back, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. You know, we all show up. I shouldn't say we all do. But one of the great things about golf, and maybe just athletes in general, is look at Tiger Woods. He shows up in character. You ever notice that? I mean, on Sunday, he shows up wearing black pants and a shirt the color of blood. Fred Cup, he's like an actor. I don't know what he's listening to in his car on the way there, but buddy, once that door opens and those cleats hit the ground, Tiger Woods is playing a role. I'm badass Tiger Woods, the most fit. You know. Now, the, his role's changed because, you know, he's dealing with the emotion of shame and whatever he's got to deal with with all the stuff that's happened to him. But, but Fred Couple shows in, couple, in character. Ah, I don't really, I don't really care, ah, whatever, you know. But he wants to cut his throat out. But that's his Greg Norman the Shark character, Jack Nicholas the Bear character. I showed up in character, kind of. You probably came to the mound in character. Yeah, oh, I went to Julian with a big red nose. Yeah. You know, I yeah. went to Julian kid to be kid. Yeah, I was the second best pitcher there. <laughs> <laughs> Terry Gannon being the first. Yeah. No, but um, No, you're right though. You're right. right. Gosh, if you don't, don't if you don't do that, I mean I, I I've always told people there are times when you gotta tell yourself how the mountain but you're shy young, right? In your heart and your mind you think, boy, I don't have I don't have squat today. But I can't let the opposition know that. No, you same can't. same way in golf. Yeah. Well, no, I, it's different. I think that you can, uh, you know, when, when I was the Ryder Cup captain, um, Kenny Perry was on our team. He's from Kentucky. We were playing at Valhalla. And, I mean, Kenny's like 47 or 8 years old now, and he's, a, he's on our Ryder Cup team, and I know he's going to be a nervous wreck. And so we go to the Muhammad Ali Museum before the matches start, and I, I personally kind of just put my arm around Kenny Perry, and I said, hey, man, I said, I want to just talk to you a minute. I said, I just think you're going to be the most nervous guy here this week. And uh, I want you to consider something this week. So you notice how Tiger Woods shows up in character, you know? And I went into how all these guys show up in character. I said, wouldn't it be awesome if you showed up in character this week? If you were Kentucky's own Candy Perry, and like, I'm gonna show off. I'm the best player to ever. I just said, wouldn't it be so cool if you were the best player to ever come out of Kentucky? And that's who you, the role you played? Because right now, nobody can touch you. You are the best player ever from this state, buddy, and you better know it. I said, so why don't you show up in character this week and go show off for your people? And I swear, he had the best Ryder Cup ever, bro. I think he would have run through that wall yeah, right there. Yeah, exactly. We were done talking. You know, I know we're, we, there's a lot to talk about, and I know people have questions. We're going to open up the questions in a little bit, but talk about the Ryder Cup, because I talked to Terry, and one of the things that he said was, hey, ask Paul about you forming the team, right, for the Ryder yeah. Cup, and you had a certain mentality, a certain blueprint to put together this Ryder Cup team. I did. I mean, how many of you remember the 2008 Ryder Cup? I mean, yeah, it was pretty incredible. I mean, 
we were underdogs going in, and uh, which was kind of an advantage, I feel. America had lost five of the previous six Ryder Cups and two previous Ryder Cups by nine points. That's hard. It's hard to lose by nine points. We only won three times in 25 years. And I had watched the Navy SEALs documentary way before I was asked to be the Ryder Cup captain. And what the Navy SEALs do in order to build cohesive units is they take a large group and they break them into small groups. And I wondered if that would work at Ryder Cup. And the fact that we've been slotted so often, I thought, maybe I can go with this outside the box approach to team building and take this large group of 12. We only have three days to bond and get them to bond in small groups. And so that was my philosophy. Now, the first thing I did when I was asked to be captain was surround myself with a bunch of people I thought could help me. I had a guy there, uh, well, how do I want to say this? It, it was, uh, my goal was to create what I felt would be the best environment for them to be successful. My strength as the captain, probably, was that I was influential enough to get them to buy in to this concept of, te to, of team building. And when I looked at the European team, and the realization is they already have small groups in place. They, the Spaniards play together. The Englishmen play together. The Irishmen, the Scotsmen. Don't they? They all play together. They're bonded by blood. They love each other. They have each other's back. They prepare in small groups. So I thought, this might be, this might be perfect. So I explained to these guys, you all know there's no shortcut to success. You can't hope for it. You can't wish for it. You have to prepare. And that was the message. I'm going to ask you to prepare in small groups. Went through the whole Navy SEAL thing with them. I changed the way the team was picked. Eight guys make the team. Three weeks later, I get four picks. So I picked Stricker. He would have made it on points had the point system kept, kept going. Now I had nine players. And so I had three groups of three. Now I had talked to these guys a lot in the three weeks after they made the team. I kept reminding them what we were doing. What they didn't know that I eventually reminded them of is through observation, I had brought a guy as a part of my team to observe the players. He's like a psychologist. And we broke those guys into into categories of personality types. And what we wanted to do was use Myers-Briggs. Anyone familiar with Myers-Briggs and the whole this thing, all the businessmen know that. We wanted to, they, they, they use personality types and they categorize them as green light, caution light, red light. Red light personalities in the workplace are trying to be avoided. So avoid green light personalities, they work, they're successful. So I thought, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna use green light personalities in these small groups. I'm going fast, so. Stop me raising No, hey, no this is great stuff. Okay, cool. So now I've got three three-man teams. So I give them the spiel again. Like I've got Justin Leonard, Anthony Kim, Bill Mickelson are partners. I mean, these guys, they're green lights together. So I call them on the phone. It's the day, I gotta make the picks the next day. I said, Bill, I said, you know there's no shortcut to success. Anthony Kim, the next phone call. You know you can't hope for it or wish for it. Then I'm talking to Justin Leonard. You've got to prepare. You guys know you're going to prepare together. I'll make you never take you out of your group unless there's an injury and illness. But now I'm going to give you ownership of your group, and I'm going to empower you within your group. Like, How are you going to do that? Anthony Kim's like, well, I've never played Ryder Cup before. How are you going to do that? I said, bro, I'm, I trust you. I said, I'm going to let you guys pick who fills out your team. I had six players who I thought were green light personalities who were playing well enough to go into their, their group. And Phil Mickelson's like, well, what if I don't want one of the six guys? I said, you pick one of the six guys, or I'll explain to you why you're wrong, Phil. So we <laughs> laughed, you know, a little bit. And that's, you know, so those three guys, I said, you guys call each other. They called each other. They called me back in an hour. And of the six names, they picked Hunter Mayhem to fill out their group. So then I call Hunter Mayhem. I said, hey, everybody, here's what we're doing. And I said, Navy SEALs, no shortcut to success, blah, blah, ownership and power. They want you. You talk about wanting to run through a wall. Yeah. He would have run through a wall for those guys. So that group was bonded. And then I went to the steady support. They were the aggressive pod. Then I went to the steady supportive group, which was, these are the guys that they organized their sock drawer by color type. You know, Stricker, Stewart, Singh, Ben Curtis. They picked Chad Campbell. I would have never picked Chad Campbell. They only had three guys to choose from that were green lights. And then the redneck pod, Boo <laughs> Weekly, J.B. Holmes, Kenny Perry, and then Fury. Well, they, they wanted, they picked, they picked J.B. Holmes, the big bomber from Kentucky. So that's how he did it. And then, you know, I, re I reestablished that message again on Monday night. And it was like, slap my hands. I'm out of the way. It's up to you. I got the hell out of the way. But I was influential enough to get him to buy in. And that, that's how we did the Ryder Cup thing. And it was different. And, you know, I think the cool thing, too, was for somebody like Mickelson and Stuart Sink and Jim Furyk, who'd only been used to getting their butts kicked at Ryder Cup, they began to dread the event. It's a huge stage. The, they're under the scrutiny, you know, the microscope. 
um, and they've been ridiculed for years and years about this Ryder Cup, and they really looked forward to this Ryder Cup for the first time, and they played awesome. I mean, they did. Now, as captain, are you an emotional guy? Well, how would you describe yourself as a red, yellow, or green light type player or personality? Um, I probably, some of the guys would have been green lights with any group, and some of the guys were really difficult to, to fit in. I probably, I don't know, I don't know. I, I don't know what I was. I know what my personality was, mm -hmm. but um, that's not important. <laughs> Uh, but are you a calm, you're a calm, cool, collected type guy? Are you that? I mean, I'm, off, real, off, I'm just real OCD about everything. You know, I, I communicated with the players according to personality. I told the story today at lunch, and it actually is in the book. So Anthony Kim, right? He's 22 years old, street kid, grew up in the streets of LA, just like a real badass. You know, mm -hmm. played basketball, the whole deal, and uh, he turned out to kind of be our team leader. You know, hey Singer, I want to kick Sergio's ass, man. Let's you play Sergio, and I'm, I'm laughing at him. You know, I think it's hilarious, but. The first day, he and Mickelson are going to go out, and they're going to play, uh, who are they playing? They're playing Padre Carrington, who's won two majors in a row, and then they're playing Robert Carlson, who won the tournament before the Ryder Cup. So, like, they got their two best players. We got our two hottest players. And I'm like, go show off, buddy, because the message really was to go show off for our people this week. I hadn't seen those guys for a while. I mean, like, they were three down after 12 holes, and they won the 13th hole. So now Mickelson and Anthony Kim are two down. Um, through 13, and AK's on a straight up alternate shot, and he airmails the green. And I got the guy with me to do the personality profiling together, and, and, and I said, Oh my God, I gotta say something. I gotta say something. This is our best team. And he says, Go challenge him. Just go challenge him. So I'm in the cart, and I got a long haul in the cart to get down to him through the crowd and the whole deal. So what are you you're thinking? Are you thinking to yourself, What am I gonna say? What am I gonna say? What am I gonna say? I don't know what I'm gonna say, but I mean, Mickelson's gotta hit the next shot. He's airmailed the, uh, Anthony Kim airmailed the green. Now Mickelson's got to hit this shot. And so now you got to realize I haven't seen Anthony Kim since the first heat. So it's been a couple of hours, three hours almost. So I go under the rope and, and uh, I look at AK, he's like right there. And I just kind of stood, I walked over there. I got a little bit too close to him maybe. I got in here and kind of just looked at him like this and I just folded my arms and I looked at him like this and I looked away. And I looked at him again and he said, what's the matter, Captain? So I think, challenge, challenge. And I was like, I said, dude, I thought you were going to show off for me today. You're showing me squat. <laughs> I mean, I said that to him right in the middle of the matches. And he just busted out laughing. I mean, of all things. He so just, that, that could go both ways. That could just crush a guy. You can't say that to, the, you can't say that to so, Stuart Sink. Or, so or you were relieved by his reaction. Oh, my God, yes. Because I laid it on him. Right. I thought you were going to show off for me today. Show me nothing. And he just started laughing. He goes, relax, man. We're not going to let them beat us. And that's how it worked out. And those guys played good. I messaged, you know, another, another story about that Ryder Cup. J.B. Holmes, for example, you know, um, he got there. He was a Kentucky boy, too. So uh, he loves Valhalla. The players show up on Monday. But J.B. was there on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Sunday night, we're watching football. J.B. Holmes, his wife, and my, my wife and myself, we're watching Football. And all I'm trying to do is talk about anything but golf with JB because he's so overprepared and so jacked up. And uh, finally, out of nowhere, JB Holmes just he just says, "Man, I hope somebody, somebody pisses me off this week, Zinger." <laughs> I said, "How come, man? How come?" He goes, "Man, if somebody pisses me off, I will kick their ass." And I'm like, "Oh man, that's like me, JB. I'm the same way. If someone makes me mad, I'll I'll, I'll whoop them." So I file that away. I had an assistant with each one of my pods. So Olin Brown's with the redneck pod. And only in the 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 I the, uh, no, the uh, assistants aren't allowed to talk to the players during the match. Only the captain can talk to the players, but they can report to me. So I get this call over the radio. Hey Zinger, uh, I said, what's up, O? He goes, man, he says, JB's in big trouble, dude. I said, what's the matter? He says, he's hitting it like crap. He keeps missing it way to the right. He's hitting these push blocks to the right. I said, all right. So what hole we on? He says, we're on number eight. We're heading to nine T. So what, what what's the match? He says, we're two down. I said, I'll be right down there. So I'm watching TV. I'm in the clubhouse when he radios me. I'm getting a Coke. And I'm watching on TV, and there's, you know, Dan Hicks saying, ooh, Lee Westwood is getting all irritated with J.B. Holmes and Boo Weekly because, you know, Boo's doing all this stuff. And, and then they zoomed in and showed the look on Westwood's face as he's staring. I don't know if you remember this. He's staring holes through J.B. Holmes and Boo Weekly. I'm like, wow. Um, I had all the coaches' numbers, so I get on the phone. I call uh, – I call Matt Kill and J.B. Holmes, coach. I said, hey, Matty, Matt, are you watching? He goes, oh, yeah, I'm watching. I said, man, Boo's hitting it way to the right, bro. I said, what's going on? You, can you fix that? He goes, yeah, yeah, he's, bringing, he's coming down too much from the inside. I said, have you ever told him that before? He goes, yeah, we work on that all the time. I said, all right, man, thanks. So I hung up, jumped in the car, hauled butt down to number nine. 
And they've already teed off, and sure enough, Davey's way off in the right jump. And here's Davey coming. The whiskey stuff's about this tall, the grass. And here he comes 100 miles an hour. And I, I, I catch up to him. I say, hey, man, slow down, bro. Slow down. So we slow down, and we start walking. And we're walking at a nice, slow pace. And I said, hey, JB, man. I said, you hit it way right, man. Hitting those blocks to the right? He goes, yeah. And he's young, too. He's in his early 20s. I said, I said, man, I said, I just talked to Matt on the phone. And he said, when you're blocking it way right, you're coming down too much from the inside. Has he ever told you that before? He goes, yeah. Now we're up by his ball. I said, does that make sense to you right now? He goes, yeah, that makes sense. I said, all right, go get him. I walked about three yards. I turned around. I said, hey, one other thing, man. I said, I was in the clubhouse a minute ago watching on TV. I don't know if you know this or not. That Lee West was giving you dirty looks. He goes, what? I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> I said, they're talking about it on TV. He goes, I'm going to kick his ass. <laughs> and man, he did too, buddy. He hit it about four feet on nine, and he drove it. I swear, he hit it so far off the tee on, on ten. Ten is six, ten or something. Yeah. He hit driver six iron over the green. <laughs> and that is impossible. But they came back and tied that match too. It was big. So you end up winning the Ryder Cup that year, and then all of a sudden, after all you had just said, after setting things up with the team and the personalities, did anybody come to you and say, Captain, my ca hello, captain. captain, my captain, uh, way to go. I mean, you're, I not, uh, you're the reason why we were successful in this Ryder Cup. Uh, not really. I mean, you know, the players. Or, or nothing, need to be, need, nothing needed to be said. No, I, I think the media gave me credit. You know, I was always saying, you know, because once it came out, you know, that this is, we did this whole different kind of thing. Because truthfully, I mean, you know, my, all my Ryder Cups and President's Cups and stuff, I mean, the captain pretty much says, you know, go get them. Who, you, who don't you want to play with? I mean, that's the extent. And, you know, I went way the extra mile. And I always said, if we win this Ryder Cup, I will have the lowest IQ of any genius that ever lived. <laughs> and it's true. I became, like, the media genius. Like, oh, my God, he pulled it off. But, you know, truthfully, it was, it was weird. I just, uh, you know, my goal was to create the best environment for success, really, in the end. And, and I think every captain's going to create some kind of an environment. You got an environment in that dugout, don't you? Mm, absolutely. And team locker room. Yeah. So the, the, you know, the, the manager creates an environment, and there's a certain, there's a certain something that, that it's like in the workplace. You know, some of you are bosses, some of you are employees. Um, you know, the reality is somebody's created an environment in your workplace, and it's either really, really healthy or it's not really, really healthy. Uh, the analogy I, I can talk about from, from my experience is that a type of manager like a, a Bobby Cox with the Braves or a Larry Boa, who I played with in San Diego, Larry Boa, he would show every little emotion. Guy would walk a, you know, a pitcher would walk a hitter, he'd be kicking and MFing guys. And you know, well, if you're a ball player, you're on the bench, and you see your skipper doing that, what do you do? Oh my gosh, if I fail, he's right away you have Bobby Cox or somebody like Tony La Russa, who's kind of stoic. And you know, says a, says a couple of words like you said, hey, go get them or whatever. Uh, that, that goes a long way because they see that the manager and the stress, okay, they're calm, they're cool, they're like, okay, hey, look at Skipper, he's got confidence in us. It's, it's along the same, uh, same lines. Yeah, for, for me, it was important to know the players well enough that I could communicate with them according to their personality type. And, uh, you know, Boo Weekly was the all time great personality. Who, who, everyone heard of Boo Weekly? Yeah. Okay, so he's on a Ryder Cup team. He's the all time ultimate redneck. I mean, when he qualified for the tour, he showed up for the tour school afterwards where they'd like teach you about how to manage your money and where to deposit your money and set up your Merrill Lynch account and how to dress and how to, you know, carry yourself and what to do and what not to do and how to travel. And, um, you know, you get set up with all this stuff. And Boo shows up and I swear he had. White overalls, no shirt, <laughs> no shirt. Some of the guys were, you know, they were dressed, sport coats, and do show white open. I mean, he's sure enough redneck. So, you know, Boo was like, man, I, I, I much want to play good for Mr. Zinger. That's all I knew, play good for Mr. Zinger. Well, one, the night that, you know, you have this big gala dinner, and uh, it's like it's dressed to the nines. We're all tucked out. The women are on their sequin gowns. And, it's like Hollywood, you know. They red carpet us right into this giant gala dinner, you know, $2,500 a plate. Dan Hicks is going to introduce us. We're way up high, and our audience is down here in this big theater, and the European team comes down this staircase, and we come down this staircase and introduce us. We shake hands, go our separate ways. Well, we're waiting, and we're waiting for this whole thing to, to, to happen. And I'm nervous. I'm going to have to speak a little bit. And 
we're all sitting around in this big circle. There's this little thin partition separating us from the Euros. And normally the Euros are yucking it up, but not this time, it was us. And so I looked at Boo, and how many of you ever heard about Boo getting in the ring with an orangutan? Some of you heard I've never heard about it. Yeah, okay, so I know there's some, I don't ever want to like rob Boo Weekly of this story, so I'm, hopefully it won't ever go anywhere. So let's just all promise we won't tell this, because I don't, I don't want it to go public, and then he's not able to tell the story, but I'm going to do my best tell this story like Boo Weekly called us and brought us to our knees. Okay, so we're all in our tuxes. We're circled around. I said, hey, Boo, man. I said, you ever, is it true you got in a ring with an orangutan? He goes, oh, hell yeah. I said, man, what happened? He says, man, we was at the fair in the panhandle up there in Baghdad, Florida. And he says, man, this, we're sitting in the back of my truck drinking a few beers, and this fella drove up in his pickup truck, and he got this trainer on the back. I'm like, okay, okay. He says, man, he says, this fella goes in there. He starts pulling stuff out of that big old trailer. Next thing we know, he can build himself a boxing ring. He's about this big right here. He's, he's kind of about big as this circle right here. He says, he goes back up in that trailer. And he said, come out with this little thing. He started rolling his car down there. He said, there's a little fella in there about that tall. Orange, got a big old long arm, and big old boxing gloves on his arm like that right there. He goes, y'all have seen orangutan walk? Now, I'm telling you, we, had, we were already crying Chris, because of the way he's doing And then he starts imitating how an orangutan walks. You know, he's doing this. And he says, the orangutan walks across the ring, flops down in the corner, and folds his arms like this. He says, they got some long arms there. They got some real long arms. He got the big old boxing gloves on. He said, next thing we know, the fella, he started walking around the ring. He yelled, five for 50. Five for 50. Five dollars to get in the ring. Fifty dollars if you can hit my orangutan. He was like, we got to do that. <laughs> so, so. My favorite line of this whole story is Boo then he is abusive. So what we done was we gathered up five dollars amongst us. <laughs> he said, then we drew straws. He said, I drew the shortest straw. So I got to get in there. He says, so I collected five dollars. He said, I walk up to the man, I hand him the five dollars. He said, I signed a waiver. He said, the man put the one glove on, he put the other glove on. Then he went and put the headgear on, squeeze it down on my head, he said, kind of come down here like that. I'm looking at my buddies over there, they're laughing at me. I'm like, Muhammad Ali, doing like this right here. He said, next thing I know, I wake up in the back of my truck. <laughs> Out like a light. <laughs> so then he says, he's in the back of the truck, and he's got his like, ice on his head. You know, and then he asks us, and I'm telling we're in cities, right? He says, any of y'all ever been knocked out before? And we're like, uh, no, we're golfers. We've never been in a fight. He says, man, you get the sheet paint on here. He says, I got this bag ice on my head. I can hear it's 550. <laughs> and he says, I look over and he says, man, he says, I swear to God, the biggest man I've ever seen coming at us. And here he comes. He says, he's one of them pine tree miners from the panhandle. He's one of them pope wooders. He says, and he said, the fellow was 6'10, and he was huge. He said, his head was the size of a cow. He said he had tight jeans, no shirt, tan, shaped like a V, and he was already in a full sweat. And he said, he walked up there and he handed a man $5. He said, he signed a waiver. He put the one glove on, he put the other glove on. He said, he went to put the headgear on, and the man said, no, nah, sir, I ain't wearing no headgear. He said, sir, you need to wear the headgear. He said, no, nah, sir, I ain't wearing no headgear. He said, sir, you need to wear the headgear. He said, no, nah, sir, I'm fit to kill your monkey. <laughs> Boo says, man, get in, he's doing like this right here. He says, I swear to God, I can still hear the wind coming off that orangutan call. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, down he goes. Out like a light. And then Boo starts going, ah, look at this. <laughs> oh, my God. Is that any good? Oh, that's awesome. Oh, oh my God. God. Probably the, the, the craziest personality or oh, that he had. Who's the guy who's the most... Uh, the uh, opposite of that. that you've oh, there's some tight. Every, I mean, there were some tight guys on that team, man. Furyk's a pretty tight guy, and those two were together. You almost separated Furyk from that redneck pod. I'm like, you know. Did you Did you see? Uh, you said Furyk, or no? Who was the uh, the tight the tight one? Furyk. Furyk's pretty. Did tight. he loosen up a little bit? Oh man, man. With him? I told Furyk. I said, you know, Boo can get down on himself. So can Kenny Perry and Davey Holmes. I said, man, you might have to be an encourager to those guys. Yeah. And uh, I said this today at lunch. I said, you know. Jim Furyk's not, he, you know, he got to go outside of who he is to become a green light to be with those guys. And uh, I said at lunch today, I said, man, Jim Furyk, I, I said, he not, I never seen him kiss his wife. And she's dang good looking. <laughs> and he got his arm around Kenny Perry the first day and just chirping in his ear, picking up Kenny Perry. It was awesome. It was awesome to watch him. Who talks the most smack? Phil. 
Mickelson? Oh my god. San Diego guy. You better believe it. Really? What are you a San Diego guy now? Well, just because you broadcast. No, it? no. I, 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 this is where my I heart. Mean, is. Come I, on, I live man. in San Diego, You're but I'm, 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 this is where I'm from, man. This is my roots right here. No, so, right? Hey, that's right. Believe it. Proud to be from the Jets. Believe it. Now Nicholson's a smack talker. He he is a smack. See, I wouldn't have guessed. I'll that. tell you Nicholson's story. I'm playing. Payne Stewart and I are playing Nicholson and Crenshaw, and we're playing a hundred dollar hammer. And I don't know if you ever played hammer before, but. It's like the Rubik's Cube if you're playing backgammon. The hole starts for 100. When you get the, when either team gets the advantage, they can double the bet at any time. If you beg out, you forfeit the 100. If you take it, the hole, now you're playing the hole for 200. If you pull off a spectacular shot, the hammer goes, you know, like if I hammer you, and then all of a sudden you come out, you take it, now we're playing for 200. You hit a great shot. Mm -hmm. Up there four feet, you look at me and say, I'll hammer you back. Now we're playing for 400. Ooh. Okay, so it's a heavy game. And if I beg out, I just forfeit the 200, and we don't even finish the hole. So we're playing, and uh, we get to 18, and Payne and I are getting slaughtered. And Mickelson, we've all made par, and Mickelson got about a 12-footer down the hill. This is he's probably the second year in playing the tour, and uh, he hammers. So the bet goes to $1,800. This is how out of control it had gotten. If he makes the putt, we lose eighteen hundred. If he misses the putt, we lose nine. We lose nine hundred. If we beg out and don't even take the bet, we lose four fifty. Is that right? Something like that. I, I was not good at math, but I think. Meaning right. that's close. Now. So, if we beg out, we lose. If we beg out, here's what it's 450. If right? we beg okay, out, we lose. Have no, if we beg out, we give him 900 bucks. Right. If he misses, we only lose 450. If he makes it, we lose 1800. That's what it was. So Payne says, "I'm out." I said, "You're out." I said, "How can you be out? It's 12 feet. He ain't making that." Payne's like, "I'm out. He's making that." I said, "He ain't making that." He goes, "Oh yeah, he's gonna make it." I said, "Well, god dang it, dude." I said, "I want to take the bet." Crenshaw, being the nicest guy in the world, he goes, "I'll take Payne's side." I said, "All right, go give him your 900 bucks, you big loser." I looked at Nicholson, my exact words, I'm a cuss, I love my exact words, I looked at him and said, put it, bitch. <laughs> Dead the center. Ah, 1,800 bucks. Like, oh. But Nicholson's, yeah. and then he just, you know, he's got dimples, you know, like you, those little dimples, and he just smiles at us when we kill him. He, that's when I knew he was going to be a, an exceptional player. though. He just has that ability to make that putt, you know. And isn't it weird how somehow you People think of Mickelson like a choker or, you know, it's just crazy. That guy's won 42 yeah. tournaments, three, four or five majors, whatever. Unbelievable player. Class. Toughest course you played? Toughest course? I don't know. Uh, probably Olympic Club, it's Pittsburgh. Texas. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, Oakmont. Oakmont. What? Olympic Club's pretty hard, too. Why? It's just the greens are 15 on the set meter. They're just like this, slope like that. Hard as a rock. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Talk about Tiger Woods. I mean, you know, our perception, we see him on TV and you talk, you know, I don't want you to throw anybody under the bus, but give us some dirt. Is he a Jagoff? <laughs> I hear he's a horrible tipper. Yeah, he, he, he can tip over uh, fire hydrants. Yeah, he can. I mean, I could get in a lot of trouble if this gets out. You know, he's, I would say that uh, I used to really like him. I don't, I don't like him quite as much as I used to. We'll just say that. That's fair. We're like that. And yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, he's dealing a lot. I don't think he's going to break the record. And I only have just started thinking that probably about December of this year. Or last year, I'm sorry. Um, I thought this guy's going to break the record. He's going to break the record. But what Tiger had on everybody, he had several, he had a few things on everybody that he's lost a little bit. Um, he's lost that uh, that intimidation factor a little bit. Uh, you know, I was not, I wasn't in my prime. I was past my prime. But my generation got to see him early on when he was out of control, good, like ridiculous good, best he's ever been. And uh, I always felt this was the most prepared athlete, most prepared player, most committed that I'd ever seen uh, any sport. And uh, little did I know that I was more, I was more prepared and more committed and more disciplined. He, I thought he was the most disciplined athlete ever. But, you know, we were more disciplined than him. We just didn't know it. This generation knows it. So he's lost that advantage. 
that all of a sudden that, those black pants and the shirt, the color of blood doesn't have quite the effect. Mm -hmm. He's dealing with the emotion of, you know, I mean, let's say you're the most revered athlete on earth, and then all of a sudden, out of, in a blink of an eye, you're kind of the butt of a joke on Jay Leno and David Letterman overnight. So he's dealing with the shame. And you may love him forever, you may hate him forever, I don't know. You may be indifferent and not care. But the reality is, when you deal with shame, you have to forgive yourself if you're going to move on. Some people are now going to not like you, whereas like 97% loved him. You know, now it's like 50-50. And it doesn't matter if it's 50-50. He had to forgive himself in order to play well. And I'm thinking, when he started to win, I'm like, he's finally forgiven himself. And he's changed directions, changed his life. And then the incident happened here at the end of the year. Now he's dealing with another emotion, which is probably a low self-esteem. You know, there's just so much stuff going on in his head. You know, you make decisions in your life, and they affect you for the rest of your life. And I think he's made some, he's made some bad decisions, and uh, it's, I, think, I, I think it's going to keep him from, being, uh, from breaking the record, personally. In his prime, best golfer would ever walk the course, or who, who would be oh, yeah. in, your, in your opinion? Who? No, no one can touch what that guy did. Had, that, had it not all come crashing down, I almost am convinced he would have had the record already. It, it is, you know, we're six years removed from that incident, uh, five and a half years, whatever it is, and uh, I mean, you just have never seen anything like it. I would hit balls next to him. I hit my wedges good, buddy. I'm going to tell you what. I'd hit balls next to that dude, and I'd be like, pick up my bucket and move on down. Really? I don't want anybody to see me hit my wedges against what that dude is doing. He was so good. Oh my God. Is he tough, tough to get, uh, tough tough to get, get close, close to? to? Yeah. Did, no, did he, did he put up a barrier? Yo, oh, yeah. He had that intimidation factor. He was real. Tiger was, uh, he never, I think he, I think Tiger was the kind of guy who would be uncomfortable if you were comfortable with him. Mm. And when Rocco was so comfortable with him in the playoff, I think it unnerved Tiger a little bit. He didn't play as well. But if you're uncomfortable with him, he loves that. And I think he tried to portray it. He wanted you to be a little uncomfortable with him. But, uh, man, I'm, my neck still hurts from watching a two-iron he hit. When we were in the last group at Muirfield Village, and I was leading the tournament, I buried the first hole, and I'm up by two. I'm like, I'm going to whoop your ass today, buddy. And then uh, we go cruising along, and we get to number five, the par five at Muirfield Village, and I'm still too clear. And uh, I, had, I had played with Nichols the first two days that week, and I'd hit, in the first three, three days, I'd hit a dozen nine irons or wedges, one dozen, 12 of them, inside three feet for the week. I mean, I was just, I'll finish, tap in, tap in, tap in. Well, we get to five, and I can reach. It's like 236 to the front. I'm hitting a, I'm still going to hit a three-wood because it's a little into the wind. Pins right up against this wall. You know, it's grass, but it's a bank of water. And I hit this three-wood, it's right at it, but I hit it a groove or too low. And I knew, it was like, this is going to be close. I hate when that When I hit it a groove or too low, that's brutal. I know, I know. But I'm like, this is going to be really close. And it hit this far below the bank. I mean, if it's that much higher, it's mm -hmm. on the green, rolls to the back, I can probably keep up for birdie. Hits the bank, water. To this day, my neck still hurts watching Tiger. I'm sitting here like this, just hitting the water. Got a little bit of a, you know, I'm a little pissed. You got the red ass. A little bit, yeah. He's about here to the podium. Yes, I ain't really watching that shot. He's got this tear, and I'm thinking, what the I'm sitting in the water, he's gonna follow me right in there. Oh. <laughs> I've never seen a ball go that high in my life. Best shot I've ever seen. And where did it land? Boom! Four feet, five feet behind the hole. You guys probably remember that shot. You remember that two iron? I mean, it's like the most, it's the most I think it's the most famous two iron here. Really? Oh my god. Tapped it in for Eagle. I made I got I made bogey. I went two up, one down. The dude just coasted 65 like nothing. We're walking down 17. I hadn't said one word to him except for nice shot all day. And I'm getting smoked now. I'm just going to end up tied for a second with Sergio. So we get to 17. And, you know, Tiger, like, when we first met, when he was still a, an amateur, and early on, he used to imitate my swing all the time. And he worked with my coach how to hit wedges. And so he used to imitate me on the driving range hitting wedges. And we used to have fun. And uh, so I had said Jack to him all day, and we're walking down 17. I think he really wanted to do battle with me, but I just couldn't do it. I just didn't have whatever it was. I shot 72 or 3. He shot the easiest 65 I've ever seen. And I walk up to him on 17. I looked at him and said, hey, man, it's a great playing today. Congratulations. He was awesome. He said, I feel like I owe you an apology. He goes, what do you mean? He said, I think you expected more from me today. And I felt that in my heart. Like he wanted, he was so good that he was disappointed that I couldn't give him more. 
Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's how good he was. Yeah. And that I say nobody's ever been that good. Yeah. And as great as Nicholas is, and Nicholas will have the record and he'll maintain the record. How many short is he? How many shy? Four major Four. short. And you know, hey, look, I think Tiger can still be really, really effective till he's 45 or six years old, probably. And he's probably 38. You know what I mean? He can definitely do it. I don't think he will because I think emotionally and um, intimidation, I think he's lost some of that a little bit. So that's just my opinion. You know, when I look at golfers back then and the technology, how that's just skyrocketed. Yeah. Is it fair to say that the golfers back then, like the, the Palmers and the um, Trevinos and the, uh, the Nicholases, uh, they use like persimmon woods and they don't have the, the big drive. Are they essentially better golfers because they didn't have the technology that this generation has, in your uh, opinion? No, I don't no? think so. I think that different generations are hard to compare. But those guys back then, they did, they did swing. Um, it was a little more feel. You know, it's, it's changed. You know, I said earlier, it's the artist and the engineer. You know, Byron Nelson had a great quote, and uh, I used this at lunch today, I talked about it, but he said there's, in golf there's two kinds of players, those that need to know a little and those that need to know it all, which one you think is easier. And I mean, it's obviously the guy that just needs to know a little, right? Mm -hmm. right. Tiger's become the guy that needs to know it all. Right. And a lot of these guys are, and I think personally, I think it holds them back a little bit. For the golf ball to be able to be hit 320 and 330 in the air, and guys not shooting in the 50s five times a year, 10 times a year, that's mind-boggling to me. Speaking of a golf ball, you know how many dibbles on a regulation golf ball? Uh, 386. 382. All right, I'll give it to you. You better believe it. It's like 380 to 432. Get you some of that. Yeah, believe that. Um, believe it. Before we're going to open up the questions uh, out in the crowd, I uh, just want a little uh, either or. Augusta or Pebble Beach? Pebble Beach. Callaway or TaylorMade? Uh, what do you shoot by? What do you, what do you, what I just signed with Taylor May. So. Did you really? Yeah. Dude, I just got fitted up in uh, North, 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 North County. The, the speed light or the, oh, uh, yeah. the whatever, what are the speed blades? And I got the, the, um, the one with the, uh, nice talking to you. Um, <laughs> oh, what's it called? It's got the little thing on the bottom where you can adjust the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a gimmick. I'm still, I'm still, I'm still in the woods. Hey, you want my two cents on irons versus driver? Yes. Like, driver technology through the roof. NASA engineers got laid off. They went into the golf industry. High speed, that high speed video came in and you can see a golf ball go flat on the side. They can measure RPMs, like spin rate of a golf ball. Club head speed, ball speed, RPMs. Once that happened, these engineers just figured out, it's math. Launch angle, RPM, ball speed, it's simple math. If you want to hit it farther, I love it when someone says, oh, in order to hit it farther, you've got to go to the gym. That's a bunch of crap. If you want to hit it farther, get a launch monitor and figure out what your optimum launch is. All right, Javelin throws, yep. he throws it at 17 degrees. 17, if he throws it at 16, it won't go as far. If he throws it at 18, it won't go as far. He throws it at 17 degrees. So that's his goal, 17 degrees. Iron technology, a bunch of crap. Really, why? Because the golf ball is the same size as it's always been and it's sitting on the ground. Yeah, some irons are a little more solid than others. Shaft technology, that's different, but this forgiving iron is not, it's not, they're lying to you. There's no such thing yeah. as a forgiving iron. If you hit it thin, it's thin. Yeah. It's coming up short. If you hit it fat, it's coming up short. If you hit it on the toe, it's going to hook. If you hit it on the heel, it's going to slice. The ball is still touching the ground. You know, it's amazing because I, I went up to the TaylorMade place in San Diego. They put all those little sensors on you. Yeah. And they, they monitor your swing. And like you said, the ball rotation. When he first got me up there, he goes, just take your normal swing. I was getting a lot of loft and like 4,200 revolutions. Yeah, they want you to let down. So he gets his little guys out, right with the new head on there, yeah. took it down to like 2,600. He goes, you'll get a lower shot and you'll get more distance. It's amazing. It's just math. It really is math. Okay, meat or fish? Eat or fish? Meat or fish. Oh, meat or fish? Oh, man, I love them both. I think seafood is my favorite food. Beer or wine? I'm um, red wine right now. Rock and roll or country? Rock and roll. Disco or jazz? Disco or jazz? Disco or jazz. You heard the question. Did I stutter? Uh, uh, jazz. Jameson Irish whiskey or Jenna Jameson? Oh, Jenna, Jenna, Jenna. Jenna. I, you know, I get, if I drink too much, I get to spin, so it Ch makes me throw up. Chocolate or vanilla? Uh, chocolate. Okay, now let's talk ice cream. What? Nothing. <laughs> Boxer. 
Boxers or briefs? Yeah. Depends? I like both. Yeah, depends. <laughs> Favorite movie of all time? Jaws. Why? That's sharp. It, that movie affected me more than any movie. I was You're going to need a bigger boat. boat. Yeah, I was in the water every day of my life, snorkeling. I, I never did scuba dive, but I snorkeled. I fished every day. I could throw a 10-foot cast net, sight cast everything in the world. I never got in the water. I, I will, to this day, not go in salt water because of that movie. Really? Jaws. I never let my girls go in salt water. They, they are not allowed to swim at the beach. If you were if not, you let your children swim at the beach, shame on all of you. <laughs> I'm just telling you. When you go there in the summer, when you, I sight cast sharks. I live in Florida. We sight cast bull sharks. Bull sharks bite more people than any shark in the sea. You go to Florida, I'm sight casting sharks, and there's 30 people swimming. I'm like, you people are going to get bit. I don't, my girls are not allowed to swim in the summertime in Florida, in salt water. Go ahead, next. If you weren't a golfer or, you, you know, your career as a golfer, what would you have been? I probably would have sold something. I don't know. I would have loved to have been in the boat business. I would have loved to have been in the boat business. How do you like the TV business? The I like it. How do you like it? How do you like it? I think Nobody it's... hears you. You know what? I haven't worked a day in my life, and it's, I feel like... Same here, man. I, I feel like Jesse James. My brother's always said... It's like, you yeah, know, go ahead, every first and 15th, I feel like putting on a mask and, and just, you know... I don't work. My brother's very lucky, very, very blessed. My brother's always said to me, we knew you'd never have to work for a living. We just didn't know how you could pull it off. But you know, though, it's not like, it's not like that, though. It's for going back, it's not about the money. I love going to the ballpark. It's therapeutic. Right. I love getting in the car knowing that I'm going to go see a big league ball game. Yeah. Uh, it sucks being on the road and being away from my family as I get older, you know, 81 dates. But I love my job, and it's, it's probably like, it's not about the money. No. It's about being, being, and you know, you, still want to you don't want to be content. You want to always want to try to strive and get better at what you do, which I try to do. But it's, you know, I'm comfortable. I love what I do. And it's, it's awesome. It's, it's not about that. You know, broadcasting is something, too. It's either, you know, I, for me, it's a, it's, a, it's a privilege to be able to be an analyst. It's yes, it is. And, and for me to be able to do it, you know, my, I, my philosophy is, is simple when I walk in that broadcast booth. Number one, first and foremost, no, no one's tuning in to hear me. That's first and foremost. I can watch baseball with the mute button on. I can watch football. So can I. A lot of people do when I'm working, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. And I mean, same with golf. You, I, mean, I can sit in a card room and watch football or baseball, and no, you know what's going on. Yeah. It's the same with golf. The graphics tell the story. So I know no one's tuning in to hear me, and I want the picture to be descriptive, and I want to be informative. If some guy misses it to the left, I go, oh, you missed it to the left. <laughs> I mean, my producer's like, we saw that, you dumbass. I'm like, I know. Sorry. So I don't do that. I mean, for me, if a guy misses it to the left, I either say nothing, or, you know, I will either, you know, I'll either speculate, or I'll just tell you flat out why, why I thought that happened. So. Biggest embarrassment on TV. Oh, Terry Gannon. I swear, this is unbelievable. Thank God. We're at the British Open, and uh, my, I've been in the broadcast booth since '05, so I've got some experience. I did 20 tournaments in '05, 20 tournaments in '06. I ABC left golf, so I'm now with ESPN. And ESPN doesn't do that much golf, so I'm only doing handfuls of events. We're at the British Open one year, and every single year, I mean, for whatever reason this year, we're going on at 4.30 in the morning East Coast time. Unbelievable. I mean, like, we should go on at 8. We're going on at 4.30 in the morning. And we'll be on again this year at 4.30 in the morning, 3.30 in the morning, Chicago time. Well, we always rehearse 10 or 15 or so minutes before we go on air, do a little rehearse. Mm -hmm. Hey, Zinger, you know, Mike Tarico, Zinger, what are you talking about? You know, I mean, I think I want to talk about the conditions today, or, you know, I like the leaderboard. I want to try to set up what I, you know, what to look for. He goes, all right, perfect. Let's, let's, let's do that. So, all right, let's go. We do the rehearsal. So we do. Well, we didn't do a rehearsal. For whatever reason, this time, there was no rehearsal. And, and I was just piddling around on my phone or writing notes or whatever. And all of a sudden, here comes Tariko. Hey, welcome to the, you know, what about it? He's so brilliant. It's unbelievable. And he just tags down, we show the town, we show all this stuff, and, and it, you know, on camera. And it's me and Tarika on camera, 4.30 <laughs> in the morning, East Coast time. And he says, what do you look for now? But, you know, uh, this, that, uh, and the other thing. I don't even remember what I said. I said, oh, I'm kind of butchering this, but I'll do better when we're on, when we're on live. Thank God you only said that. I know, Tarika goes, It took me two hours to recover from that. So that's what Gannon was mentioning there. Right. And then we, the producer knew right away, oh my God, he doesn't know we're on. They boom, they switch over to Curtis Strange, Terry Gannon, Tom Weisskopf. And you should have seen the look on those guys' faces when they switched to them. 
oh my god. But the fact it was on at 4 30 in the morning, not one person wrote about it. I got on. And, and, yeah, and I know exactly. And you know, in this day and age with tweet, uh, tweeting and Twitter, oh. if here's my philosophy, I might say something stupid on the air, push the envelope, then you know, trying right. to be funny or whatever, it might offend somebody. But here's the gauge because I keep my phone Twitter. Out. If I don't hear something in 30 seconds, I'm in the clear. Yeah, I agree. You know what I'm saying? Hey, Facebook, Twitter, you know, it's like, for instance, uh, a power hitting right, left handed hitter will come up, right? And they'll shift the infield. First baseman, second baseman, all, everybody on the right side. Third baseman's playing deep in the hole, it's short, right? And the outfield is swung over that. And so, anyway, you know, uh, maybe let's say it's Adrian Gonzalez. So, Adrian Gonzalez comes up to the plate, right? And they show, they show the, the shift. And we'll show the high home and we'll show the defense. And I say, boy, Adrian Gonzalez up in the dish right there, and he's looking out there and he's saying, boy, you gotta be shifting me. <laughs> and Dick Edward does one of these. And I'm all like, give me, give me 30 seconds. Give me 30 seconds. I think we're in the clear. But anyway, it's just stuff like that. But rule 101, basically, remember in uh, broadcasting, you probably learned this along the way. Always a hot mic, camera's always live. Right? Yeah, no, no. I've never sworn on the air. Me neither. I've know. embarrassed myself many times, but I've never sworn on the air. How about the Bird Y11? Did you hear about the Bird Y11? No, I can't wait to hear this. This was like three, four years ago with the Twins. Day game, Yankee Stadium. Usually day games. Oh, it's on YouTube. I've it's seen on it. YouTube. It's yeah. unbelievable. So Bert and his partner are doing the open at Yankee Stadium, right? See, so, like you said, you usually rehearse. Well, you do one thing, you get distracted, your producer's in your ear, hey, we need to get going, let's go. Okay, get mic'd up, whatever. Okay, so uh, the, the guy opens up, hey, welcome to Yankee Stadium. Final, you know, three game of a three game series, Yankees, Twins, and Bert. You know, the Yankees are on a tear right now, and in the middle of all that is Derek Jeter. So, yeah, and they start rolling the, the, the B-roll of Derek Jeter, what he's done in the series, you know, whatever. You know, eight for 16 with three home runs, whatever. Yeah, Derek Jeter, and you can tell that Burt, what he's saying is not in sync with what is being shown. And you can see he's starting to, he's, he's got his foot in his mouth a little bit. All of a sudden he says, ah, F it, guys. We're going to have to do this effing thing again. Silence. <laughs> Play-by-play play guy goes, uh, Bert, we're live. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Uh, as I was mentioning, yeah, Derek Jeter's been real important to the Yankee team. Back to you. <laughs> That's and, awesome. and it went out. Is it, you, know, you talk about you just shrinking and just want to go into a hole. Chris Berman said, whatever you say into that mic, it's, it's out in space, and it's there, mm -hmm. and it's there. And, and you can't, can't take it back. back. There's no seven-second delay. You can't delay. not pull it back. So there is an element of risk. Yeah. Uh, to be an analyst, to be a broadcaster. I, mean, I try not to cuss at any point. I don't, I'm, not a, I'm not a huge cusser, but uh, I don't cuss that often. But, but uh, you know, I, I've never made that mistake on the air. I don't, yeah. when I'm, I'm, I just don't do it. I'll pull Ron Burgundy, the best of them. Yeah. Uh, you know how, like in baseball, you'll get, a, you'll get some copy from your stage managers, and it'll say, like, um, you know, the July 17th to the 20th, the Pirates are coming to town. Come for hat night, you know, whatever. Well, this one was, honoring the U.S. Coast Guard, right? So I, I, get the, I get the copy and, hey, come out to Petco Park when the Brewers come to town, the Padres, we're gonna honor the U.S. Post Guard. Oh, no. It was a P instead of a C, right? And so Dick says to me, Post Guard? I go, I said, for God's sake, if Grant sees it on the teleprompter, good Lord, he will read it. I mean, I'm just glad I, it didn't say, you know, hey, San Diego, go F yourself, yeah, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Because I, I, I probably would have read it. But I, put a, I pulled a couple of those, so. Do, when, uh, when we come on air, you know, Mike Tirico, and when we go off air, sometimes he has almost two full minutes. And I mean, I don't know how many of you are Tirico fans, but he is brilliant. Yeah. I think he has a photographic memory. He's one of the smartest people I've ever met. But what a gift to be able to He's good. have it just flow. And then, you know, the producer will go one minute, and then he keeps going. And they never stumble on his seconds. words. Never stumbles. Vince Scully never stumbles oh, on his gosh, words. Oh, my gosh, it's unbelievable. So I'm wondering, if, what's it like for you as, as in the in, – you work with Dick Enberg? Right? Yes. I he's pinch, oh, he's oh my guy. I, yeah, oh my, yeah, I pinch oh my myself. God. I mean, let's think about it. He's uh, the generation, my, my generation – Dick Enberg was the voice of sports. Of course. I remember sitting in my basement with my dad and we turned on a basketball game. This was back when I was, you know, eight, nine years old, whatever. And all of a sudden there's this guy who's wearing a blazer and a jacket. And remember TBS? Remember Eddie? In fact, uh, Eddie Einhorn, I think, from the White Sox started, or Jerry Reinsdorf, one of those two started TBS. And Dick Enberg was doing UCLA basketball. 
eight years old and I'm seeing this guy do it. Now I go to the ballpark every night and I get to work with Dick Ember. Yeah, it's unreal. And there's a phrase I always lose, use, like the Padres, you know, they haven't been getting a really a lot of luck lately during this point in the season, right? They're squaring up balls right at guys, nothing to show for. And I said, you know, the Padres just have not caught in a break for the love of Pete. When are they going to get some luck going their way? And Dick goes, whoa, 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 wait a second, wait a second, Mark. He goes, you know, first of all, yeah, the Padres need some luck, but why does Pete get all love? And I said, okay, well, then for the love of Dick. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, and once again, he did one I, you know what, Cersei, Dick Enberg is a pro's pro. Yeah, he, yeah. I've never worked with anyone who prepares himself more, but I tell you what, he hit, we, in, our, in our booth, you know, there's a cough button and there's a talk back button. Cough to kill your mic to cough or whatever, you want to talk Same to somebody. Thing. Hey, and, or there's a talk back, you can talk to your producer or your director. Hey, give me the shot of this guy's stance, give me, you know, whatever. And Dick, he actually held his cough button for like a minute and a half and there was tears coming out of his eyes. When you said that? Oh, I believe it. Yeah. I worked with Dick Enberg once. He's fantastic. Yeah. We did the ride back in '95, and uh, I was walking the fairways, and then I'd go in the booth and, and be with Johnny Miller and Dick Enberg, and it, what a treat that was. Dick, they were hilarious. But they had a whole separate set of rules for me back in 1995. Zinger, Zinger's rules: no us, no we, no them, no they. How are you neutral? Why are you even? Why are you trying to feign neutrality when you're not neutral? It's stupid. As far as being a color analyst? Yeah. See, in your in your I, mean, I wasn't an analyst. I'm, I'm a homer. homer. I'll admit it. I'm a homer. I want, I want my guys to win. I root for our guys. Yeah, well, I mean, and some people hate that. How many people out here hate a homer announcer? How? Really? Kano? Yeah, well, you can, whatever. I think he just hates you, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, there's a lot of people who hate homers. Especially uh, on the pottery telecast. Oh, they should play it down the middle. Grant's too much of a homer. He's a clown. Oh, really? I got your clown. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, but I can see where you could overdo it in golf, but at the same time. Well, that's what I'm yeah. saying. I'm getting golf seems to be a little bit more neutral. We're, you know, it's really clutch, and it's on Sunday, and these guys, you know, are coming down the stretch, and, and the U.S. is losing momentum. They lost the matches in 95, but, but when, you know, the, the key match was the Jay Haas match, and uh, his, his partner hit it. No, it was his Curtis Strange match. His, his opponent, Fowler, hit it. I think he missed the fairway, and, and Curtis just blasted it down the middle. And I yelled into the mic, give you some of that, boys. <laughs> oh yeah, see, I like that. The producer started screaming at me, you can't do that. You cannot. Come up here and make me. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of other embarrassing moments or stuff that I've said on the air. Uh, I'll use movie quotes. I'll use uh, song lyrics once in a while. There's a kid last year's name was Tommy Medica. Minor league guy, got his chance to play at the big league level. First baseman was a catcher, hurt his shoulder, so now he's just, you know, being able to play first base. So I'm thinking, you know, for the game and whatever, and something comes to mind. So I say, if he hits a home run, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. So he hits a home run in Atlanta. So I kind of, I'm going to botch the words here, but I go, I start, on the replay, I start going, and things are getting a little bit hot tonight. Fog's going on the windshield. Um, He's rocking, he's rolling, things are really rolling now. Medica, mm, 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 mm. Medica. Dick Enberg looked at me like I had 18 heads. I was going to Panama, Van Halen, with Medica as the Panama. And he, he just said, he, he, he wants to say, you are such a friggin' clown. But you know what, that's the way I want to be. Yeah, it's good. No, it's and that's. It works. You know who's funny is that David Faraday pulls that off. Yeah. Like How he, he's got Gary McCord. McCord is, McCord's a little more contrived. He's got a lot of stuff written. And uh, Faraday just comes out as one funny man. That's okay. Hey, Sue, we're going to open up to the crowd a little bit. Okay, we've got a mic out there, and I'm sure you've got some questions for Paul Azinger. How about some great stuff from Paul, huh? That's good stuff, man. Yeah, thanks. Good stuff. Yes. Ladies first. How do you guys put backspin on the ball when it gets up to the tee, and, or up to the green, up to the pin, and it like, it's way over here and it goes back? She wants to know about backspin on the golf ball. Yeah. Like, when it goes up, it just boom, slide back. You know, we use, a, we use a ball that spins, for one. Most amateurs use a ball with a harder cover that lasts longer. And, uh... Yeah, come on, that for the top. And, uh... Uh, we, we, you, you have to make it ascending below to create spin. So 
So it's obvious it's a shorter plug that creates the spin, but it's just it's simply a descending blow. Get down to make it go. Some Mickelson hits down on it so hard and with so much speed, he creates more spin than like I would. I'm a little shallower through the hit. I make less. I hit less spin. But speed is spin. No trick balls. Our, we use a golf ball that usually spins more. Some guys use golf balls up where they spin less because they, they're high spin player. Another question? Yes, sir. Yeah, your thoughts about the 2012 Ryder Cup on that final day? Anything you would have done differently? Yeah, where the hell? What, <laughs> what happened? What the heck? How many of you were at that match? That had to be awful. You know, I think uh, it's hard to know. I mean, Americans just slaughtered on the first few days. And that, that was one of the most surprising finishes, conclusions to an event I'd ever seen. And I saw, something happened on Saturday night where these guys lost their edge. And Europe had the spirit of Seve. And something was going on in their team room that was magical. And something that was going on in our team room, I think, caused us to lose our edge. I think Davis regrets sending out Tiger last. Needed Tiger in earlier so his point would, so his point would count. But uh, you know, in the end, it just it turned my stomach to watch that, and then to see Europe celebrate at our expense, it, it just it killed me. It makes you want to puke. Oh, it really does. It it's, it, it, it just infuriates you. And I'm sure all of you, you most of you, are infuriated. I mean, yeah. yeah. I just can't believe that happened. Another question for Mr. Azinger. Yes. Rank the, rank the majors, is that you're a European, rank the majors as well. Thank you. Yeah, the, the Europeans will rank the majors, almost all of them, British Open, Masters, U.S. Open, probably PGA. Uh, as an American, it's, it's getting to where you feel like the Masters is bigger than the U.S. Open. You're exempt for life if you win the Masters to that event, or until you're 65. The U.S. Open, you're only exempt for 10 years to the U.S. Open, so that makes it different. But. Uh, for me personally, I'd rather win the Masters than the U.S. Open, than the British Open, and then the PGA. Those, that's my order. The Euros would be the British Open first, then the Masters, U.S. Open, PGA. They, they say that Augusta is the most beautiful setting. It's incredible. Of any, they say even even the cuffs that they serve, you're, they're the green to match. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's just the most unbelievable place. I mean, it really is. When I say I like Pebble Beach more, you know, I like the water, I like the ocean, I like to hear the waves crashing on the beach, I like to hear the sea lions, you know, yelping in the background and all that. Want to go for a walk on the beach someday? Yeah, I'll go with it. Okay. Uh, but but there's just something about Augusta, it's hard to, yeah. you know, I, I always say to my friends when we go there, a hundred bucks if you can find a weed. <laughs> oh, just find one weed, I'll give you a hundred bucks, and you can't, I hadn't paid out yet. Next question. Yes, sir. Uh, Paul, if you could tell us the story when you were playing Savvy, and I'm not sure what Ryder Cup that was, but there was an issue. Was it your ball that might have been cut and, and should have been possibly out of play and Savvy challenged you on it? Oh, that one. Oh, I told that story unfairly. Yeah, I can tell you the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to hear the Savvy story? So Savvy and I are like, uh, you know, we kind of really like each other. I mean, I mean, he helped me a lot. And, you know, we're both very passionate and we're both, uh, you know, patriotic, I guess is the right word. Well, I draw, I draw uh, Seve in singles. He is revered, by the way, icon in Europe, and, and really even here, revered. Uh, most flamboyant, passionate Spaniard, fantastic player, blah, blah, blah. So, but he, you know, the Spanish way, he kind of had that little gamesmanship edge going a little bit. So I draw him first match out singles on Sunday, my first ever Ryder Cup. They, we open our envelope, they, you know, and, out comes the pairings. You don't, you don't match anybody. You just say, Zinger, you're playing great. You're going first. Chip back, you're playing great. You're going second. We're going to anchor with these guys. That's how you do it. So I draw seven. Curtis Strange comes right up to me. He looks at me and says, don't you let him pull anything on you tomorrow. And you know, Curtis got holes in you too, buddy. Him and Raymond Floyd got holes through you. Don't you let him pull anything on you tomorrow. Curtis is going off real late. So I get out there. The crowd's going crazy. Seve, Seve. We're in Europe. It's cold as crap, foggy out, thousands of people there. There's probably 35,000 people there. And there's probably 10,000 number on the first hole and 10,000 number on the second hole waiting for the first match. Curtis going off late. It's early, it's cold. He comes walking up to me as I'm walking to the first tee. And he says, don't you let him pull anything on you today. I'm like, okay, don't worry, okay, I got it. We both drive it down the middle on one. We both knock on the green. We both make birdie. Number two, we both drive it down the middle, but we hit three on the tee on two. 
we hit wedge into the green, and I hit it four feet, and Seve hit it about 12 to 15 feet. And Seve takes his ball, and he goes, he's ball, he's, uh, he's, I'll do my best Spaniard accent. He goes, he's ball, he's no good. I take it out of play. And he throws it to his head. Well, you know, he just hit two perfect shots. Perfect three iron, perfect pitching wedge. There's no way this ball's cut. But he hit it so good that he had shredded the paint on the ball. USDA says it's got to be visibly cut to take it out of play. You can't take it out with the paint. So I'm automatically, I'm thinking Curtis Dre, I'm thinking he's trying to pull something out of me. I look at my ball and it's shredded because I used pink square grooves at the time. Those were my wedges. So he throws it to his caddy, Ian. I walk up to Ian and I said, I'd, I'd like to see the ball. First match out, last day of the Ryder Cup, Seve by steps. I look at the ball, it looks better than mine. I walk up to Seve and he's squatted down and he's putting his other ball down. And he just kind of looks up at me like, can I help you? And I said, Seve, man, I said, uh, I don't think you can take this ball out of play. He goes, excuse me? I said, I said my ball looks worse than that, man. I said, I, I said, I just think it has to be visibly cut, and I don't think you can take this ball out of play. He looks at me and goes, is this the way you want to play today? I'm like, well, what have I done? And so I said, I just think we should ask the referee. So now we go to the referee, and the eight or 10,000 people in the bleachers, they're, they're knowledgeable, and they're like, hey, what are you trying to pull? Come on, you know, what the hell you, Yankee? <laughs> and he feeds the referee, and he looks at the ball, and he goes, you know, he says, well, I'm sorry, he said, you must play this bowl. And I said, bro, I'm sorry. I said, look at my ball, it's working. Said, no, 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 he's okay. If this is the way you want to play today, we can play this way. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> he puts his ball down. Makes it. He no. looked at it from every angle. Makes it. The crowd goes. I mean, it's one of the loudest screams I've ever heard in my life. And as it dies down, some Euro guy yells out, What would you have done with a good ball, Sammy? <laughs> oh my God. So I've always had, like, I never had really nervous hands, but I always, I could have a nervous stomach. I wouldn't eat much. I put my ball down. I got this little four footer, and I put my ball down, and I was like, Whoa, look at that. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Marked it. I hit the sweetest little pot and it goes in, except that it goes in and comes out and comes right back at me. And I make the pot and I go like this. Oh my God, it missed, it shot me and they cheered louder when it missed. Oh, I was like, geez. oh my God. And buddy, we had it out the rest of the day. I mean, we really, who asked me that? Gentleman right here. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, the whole day was like that. I hit it to the right on 10 on this big side slope and the referee comes over and my ball's on some lady's coat and uh, you know, I, I dropped it and it rolled down closer to the green. And I finally started placing it. And every time I put it down, it rolled closer to the green. And so I finally found a little clump of grass and I set it up on this sweet little clump of grass. And as I stood up, my shoulder slammed into Seve's chest. And he looks at me and goes, I want to know, I want to know right where your ball was. And I was like, holy crap. And the referee's right here. And I said, well, it was right here. He goes, how come your body's not there? I said, it wouldn't stay. He gets down with his ball and starts putting it all over it. And it wouldn't stay. I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> and then he gets up, he looks at me, he goes, now you have a perfect line. But I had no shot, but I had a perfect line. Right, right. So we, we went at it, you know, the whole way around. I ended up uh, making about a five-footer on the last hole to win the match nice. against him. So, <laughs> Great story. Well, it was, it was scary. Yeah. It was scary. It was scary. Faldo was talking about that match where Chip Beck and I played he and Woos. And actually, we were 11 under through 17 holes. They were 9 under, and we beat them 2 and 1. And that was pretty cool. Uh, but, you know, Ryder Cup's something different. You know, representing your country yeah. and all that. There's just something about it. There's no money at stake, but you're choking your guts out. Sure. Next question for, for Paul. Who's up? Yes. golfer myself. I have golf. I can, I can hear you. What is it about golf that you chose to devote your life to? What about golf that I choose to devote my life to? Yeah. I, I chose it over an actual job. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I just got really good at it in college. As, you know, I, as I said earlier, I was really pathetic. But I got so good so fast. 
And I hit thousands of balls. I really did. All my friends would go home on the weekend, and I would stay. And I hit balls, and I kept hitting balls, and I practiced, uh, you know, as much as I could. I read books, I studied every, everyone and everything I could about it, and I improved so quickly that I thought, well, I'm going to go to tour store and try it. And I paid my three grand or whatever it was at the time, and I got through, and I made it just like I made it. And so it was kind of defined for me. And then I began to have success slowly but surely. Um, you know, but I went four or five years of my pro career without having to pay taxes because I couldn't make a profit. So hard. It's a it's a difficult lifestyle. If you play well, it's a blast. If you play bad, it's terrible. And, and people don't realize. Maybe they do realize. But you should pay for your own travel. You pay for your own yeah, accommodations, all that stuff, right? Yeah. So pay for your caddy. Pay for yeah, everything. You know, I'm not much of a golfer either, but I like to page through the sports pages at the end of a tournament and you see the prize money, right? And it's like, you know, the difference between a 69 and a 68, it's like one guy's going home with seven figures, and, and not that I'm just, you know, no, but that might be the only money he makes for for 10 years. And then you go down, and then there's a difference between like 350 and 110 right. or something. And it well, goes down to one putt, one chili dip, one bad shot. shot. I always felt like it, we ch I choked for two things. I choked for money and I choked for prestige. If I couldn't win, then I, the, the prestige no longer mattered. If, if I had a putt to finish third by myself or tie for third with five other people, I was choking for the cash. And that's what they all do. They all choke for the cash a little bit. And I mean, now the money's so big. I mean, can you imagine missing a four footer, a three and a half footer that cost you like $600,000? I mean, that's real money. I don't care how much money you got. But to be able to make that kind of money is obscene, yeah. really. It's um, amazing how four feet, the difference between Stanford and Grossmont Junior College. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's right? not right. Yeah. Oh, another question for Paul. Yes, right here. Paul, again. Hey, now. Paul, I got a question regarding the 2012 Ryder Cup and all the Ryder Cups. It seems like that... The ole, ole, ole start by the Europeans. Lisa did this year at Medina in about the seventh hole. And the intimidation factor starts to really start, you start seeing the American players kind of change in their whole stroke. Is that chant really started to affect the mindset of the American players? And is that one of the reasons why all of a sudden they pulled? It seems like, except for the year they. You broke them up into the quadrants that you did, which was so awesome. You know, our year, um, you know what the crowd was chanting? When they chanted the ole, 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 our crowd was chanting, no way, no way, no way, no way. <laughs> and so the, it was unbelievable. I'm thinking, we need another, we need a good song. And I hate that. I freaking hate that song. <laughs> <laughs> it's a catchy little tune. Yeah. I mean, once you, once you sing it, it is stuck in your head for hours. Uh, but yeah, I think it does. I think it affects us. The Europeans are the fans are so fun. They dress all the Irishmen dress up in their little, you know, leprechaun outfits. It's hilarious. They just really bring a spirit with them. Um, and you know, in the end, I, I believe it. I really do believe it's a razor thin line between winning and losing those matches. Razor thin, and you got to figure out how to create, how to stop, slide your guys to that that correct side of the edge. Yeah. Speaking of the Irishman, did you hear the Irish? There's this Irishman who walks out of a bar. Yeah, it could happen. It could happen. <laughs> um, one yeah, more, that. Sue. One more question. You think? What do you guys think? One more. You want to go, Debo? You got a question? Okay, one more question, sir. Right here. Yeah. Uh, well, Leonard shot 63 one time and they were asking about Tiger. And he said it on air. Like, I mean, I just shot 63. I mean, yeah, it was irritating. But, you know, what are you going to do? Somebody writes a, an article, somebody writes something on a blog about Tiger Woods and you get 100,000 hits. And there's nobody that can drive that. Nobody. Roy McElroy, I mean, it doesn't think so. Mickelson, it doesn't matter who you write about, you might get 5,000 hits. Tiger is, uh, I mean, whatever the percentage is of the difference, that's what he is to, to our game. 
And it's a shame he's becoming kind of a bad character, honestly. It's kind of a shame, but uh, he still moves the needle, and he's the only guy that moves the needle. And personally, if I'm, if I'm watching golf, that's who I want to watch. I want to watch Tiger Woods. I just do. I want to see, because it's just ridiculous. You know, I have people say to me all the time, I'm so sick of watching Tiger Woods. All they ever show is Tiger Woods, Tiger Woods. And I'm thinking, man, would you have said that about Hogan or Sneed or Nelson? Or I'm like, he's way, way better than them. And you would have died to be able to watch those guys play. That's a good point. Stop complaining. Consider yourself lucky that you get to see somebody that good. Oh, I mean, over the top. I'm so privileged that I got to stand next to that guy and watch him hit. You know, towards the end of when I started to quit playing, you know, uh, like 07, 07, 08, he was doing the Hank Haney stuff. He started getting stuck. He still was winning, like, everything. At that point, I could actually hit balls next to him and feel okay. But I'm telling you, from about 98 to 2005 or so, 2004, I never hit balls next to him because it sounded different and it looked different and I didn't want any part of that crap. I wanted to beat him, I wanted to scratch and claw, but there's never been anything like it. I, I mean, never. Ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And then he had that. And that's what's lost. That's what's lost. Hey, how late is the bar gonna stay open? What's that? <laughs> Soup? 10.30? Okay, does anybody, do you want, to, you want to keep going with Paul? Another question? I mean, he, he would love to take another. Sure. Hey, Paul. I love your name. My son's name is Paul. He served as a My question to you is when A. Zinger and Barry showed up at your house, excuse me, Barry showed up at your house. Yeah. And the place. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, well, that, that you know, of course, that was my idea, actually. Um, the whole interview, David Ferry's brilliant, by the way, but I called him up. I knew they were coming. I, I had already turned down doing the Ferry show for a couple of years, and, and I finally thought, you know, I should do the show. And uh, I called him up. I said, David, I think I got a great idea for how to open. You know, because I'm totally into riding motorcycles, and he's totally into that bicycle. He's, his bicycle's worth about six grand or something, eight grand, 18 grand. I don't know what it's worth. It's ridiculous. He, uh, I said, why don't we open the show with a misunderstanding? You show up on a bicycle, I'll show up on a motorcycle. I didn't know he was going to go headlong into the bush in front of my house. If you get a chance to YouTube that, it's one of the funniest things you've ever seen in your life. I'm not kidding you. But did anybody give me any kudos for pulling that sweet wheelie in the driveway? Nothing? Did you? I didn't see it. I went to YouTube. Sweet ass awesome. wheelie. Sweet wheelie. A little baby wheelie. Two weeks after that, I totally wrecked that motorcycle. I totaled the motorcycle. Shattered my left shoulder. Broke my elbow. Big motorcycle guy, right? Yeah. Love, what's your choice of rides? Um, I have eight motorcycles right now. All one brand? Or you did no, like, all did like Ducati, I got Harley, Ducati, I got Triumph. Harley, give a Triumph. I got a Triumph. Really? I got a BMW. BMW. I got a Suzuki. I got two BMWs. Do you have a Goldwing? I had a gold wing, I just got rid of it. All right, cool. I'm, I've hey, owned about 45 motorcycles in my lifetime, so I'm pretty out of control. Question? <laughs> We're gonna wind it down here. If, okay, yeah. yes, uh, yes, yeah. My favorite Payne Stewart story? Oh man, I got so many Payne Stewart stories. Oh my gosh. Uh, let's see. Hmm. I'll tell you what, he came to fish with me one day. I don't drink at all. I do now. I drink a little wine now. I've been drinking red wine for about seven years just at dinner. And uh, he came over to my house to fish. And Payne loves to drink. Loves to drink beer. Like crazy, super drunk too. He like gets, uh, he doesn't ever throw up. He's one of those drunks that can drink till he's and he's hilarious fun. So we're out fishing one day and he and my buddy have, have had about a case and a half of beer between the two of them. I haven't had a beer. And we are, uh, we had to wait out a rainstorm. Payne slipped and fell and gashed his shin and blood pouring down everywhere. Quit raining, we fished some more. Finally done fishing, we go to the dock. Payne is so drunk, uh, he can hardly stand. And he's the happiest drunk in the world, but he gets so stupid. So he's got the rope and he's holding on like this. And the boat pulls up to the dock and that's the pine. And he gets in here close. And 
He goes to reach for it. You know how the boat drifts off like this. So the boat's low tide, and we got barnacles everywhere. So the boat starts to drift away. I'm like, hey, jump, man, jump. He jumps for that piling, and I'm telling you, he's holding onto that piling. He looked like, what's that little bear on a stick thing? The koala? Yeah, the koala was there. He looked like that, and he was shredded. I mean, oh, oh my God, it was there. And me and my buddy were crying laughing. And he's holding on, and he finally he steps off and walks up the ramp. And we come to my house, and Tracy, his wife, is there. And he walks in. I'll never forget this. He walks in like this, opens the door, he walks in, slams against the wall, and holds him up. And Tracy says, what the hell happened to you? I had, I had a little too much to drink. So she says, I guess, well, we better go. The next day, Kane filmed a commercial for Mothers Against Drunk Driving. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I, so I'm giving him a brief about it. He goes, I didn't drive. I, he didn't get didn't home. But it was just hilarious. I mean, he was the life of the party. He was the life of the party. He could flat out cook. He could play the harmonica. He couldn't sing for crap, but he thought he could. Uh, there's, I got golf stories. Unbelievable golf stories about him, but anyway. Well, ladies and gentlemen, would you agree that Paul Azinger has been the life of the party tonight? Yeah, thanks, man. I had to go. Thanks, man. You're the best. But, you know, there's, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of tradition here at this school, and uh, we take pride in what we do, and it shows with all the classes here. So on behalf of JCA, the Alumni Association, everybody, Paul Azinger, thank you very much for taking time. It was incredible. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Azinger. The bar's still open, so uh, I'm going to have a cocktail, so join me. I don't know how to turn this off. Yeah, I can't worry about it. Paul, thank you I so much. I can't see man. it. Thanks, Mark. You guys got a good thing going here. Yeah. Man.